Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, please let me know if this has crossed over into obsessive territory. <laughs> Every time I come live to talk about a Rachel Hollis or a, a Hollis, Hollisville in general topic, I uh, contemplate my sanity and wonder if the authorities are on their way. There's just so much to talk about and it's so interesting to me and I can't help it, so sorry in advance. Uh, if you take a look at my YouTube, it looks insane. But this is the most interesting thing going on right now in my life. Sorry about it. Uh, I know, as Dave would say, uh, what would he say? What would Dave say in this situation? Hmm, what do you think? Get a life. Yeah, probably. What, what was that again? Get a life. <sighs> yeah, well... It's true that. Oops. Aw. Oh, my sound bites are, are MIA, are they? All of them? Dang. That's unfortunate. Unfollow me. I have those. Uh, <laughs> I see all the comments. Thank you for your support. I'm glad that I'm not alone. If I was just talking into the void, I guess that would be worse. So the fact that uh, there's people here wanting this content, I guess I can justify that, right? Tell the, to call 911. I'm no, just kidding, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. I was gonna say preemptively call them to tell them I'm safe, but don't actually do that. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Let's just say that off the bat. Uh, there is a lot to talk about. Uh, first of all, let, let's see if Rachel's, is she online? Dang, I'm so sorry I didn't check these sound bites in advance. I only have a couple of them. My soundboard, I changed some stuff around trying to organize, and that's never a good idea. So I only have, but also, get a life. Unfollow me. <laughs> so we got the OGs, so we're going to have to stick to that. All right, where do we begin? So if you were not here for the other live stream that I did last week, that was last week, right? Uh, Dave Hollis is back, sort of, kind of, uh, somewhat. Uh, he is not only back on his podcast, let's, let's, uh, we did a whole reaction video to, and by we, I mean me, but you guys, some of you were here. We listened to, uh, the rise together podcast episode where Dave talked to, uh, spiritual genius and therapy trainee, uh, Gabby Bernstein, which in the meantime, I have done a lot of research on Gabby Bernstein, have lots to say. Not all good. Some good, some good, but not all good. Uh, so that'll be coming soon. But anyway, so he's back. He's no longer running. He is thriving. He is thriving and surviving. That's Dave Hollis. Uh, and a lot of people during that stream and just, you know, through the ether have been asking, uh, are Dave and Heidi back together? There was one clue in the podcast that um, said, that they, he has a partner, he has to be, he has to show up for his partner. Love the verbiage there, show up for, show up conference, show up summit, Suscon with uh, Heidi. Uh, but then, wow, he was also spotted in Heidi's uh, Instagram stories. Heidi cannot resist. Heidi loves causing drama, is my opinion on her. <laughs> uh, she will take any opportunity to include Dave when most inappropriate, which is basically at all times since you're gone from the internet. Uh, so he's, he's, they're together. Whether they're together strictly for business, I don't know. They're together physically in California. This is during the weekend. They were in Newport Beach or something. Anyways, uh, so they're together apparently in some capacity, physically at least. You know, what is that saying? I don't know. Uh, he didn't talk about Heidi at all, other than mentioning he has to show up for his partner. So interesting that he, and he also told Gabby that he loves her and that he wants to buy her a boat. Okay. So that's the update there. Nothing crazy. There's been no podcast update, no social media posts that I can see uh, from Dave. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he's still off of, the, of Instagram. He just, this was his like dip, a, dip his toe in the I'm coming back to the internet uh, phase. So there, there's that. Welcome back, Dave. Welcome back. It's been, it's been a long five weeks without you. Good 
luck in your recovery. Good luck in your real recovery, but also good luck, fake good luck in your recovery of your image as a self-help influencer. Uh, it's going to take a lot more than that podcast to convince me that you're qualified to give advice. Uh, okay, second thing, big thing on the list, and I want to address it quickly. Scooba doop doop. The biggest news of the day was this thing called the Skinny Confidential Podcast. All right, here we go. This is what it looks like. So Rachel uh, showed up on this podcast. We already knew that she was on it because she had posted, or the Skinny Confidential had posted Instagram stories of her, and it was filmed in LA. I well, I don't know. Actually, I have no idea. It, maybe I'm now. I'm starting to try and guess myself as I say it. Um, she was she was somewhere. She flew somewhere to do this podcast. I was gonna say LA, but then this this couple lives in Austin too, so I don't know why she'd have to fly. And then I was thinking, well, she was in New York, but why would they be in New York? I don't know. Unsure. I don't follow this podcast, and after uh, listening to it, I definitely will not be listening to it in the future because I thought there was a lot of issues with how they interviewed her. There was a lot of contradictions of what they said and who said what and why. And she, I ha I'm gonna do a video where I'm not live because I think it's important. There's two episodes. So this one was 4, 4.43, it came out yesterday, but they also interviewed her back in 2018. They interviewed Rachel back in 2018. And there's so much to talk about between the two of them, the two episodes and the people involved and like, oh, thank you, Donald from Detroit. Welcome, welcome, I appreciate it. Okay, for that. Oh, I'm not gonna play the intro song for that. But also, I'll play. Get a life. Please. Unfollow me. Thank you. Um, so normally I would come on and do a live and just like react, blind react. But there's like two hours of content there. I think there's a lot to pull out and I want to be thoughtful about it. So I'm not going to play this one. If you're, if you're waiting to do that, I'm very, very sorry. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I know. I suck. Uh, but I've, I'm already like halfway done with the video. So if you're patient, <laughs> tomorrow-ish. Uh, that'll come out and then you can get my full thoughts because I don't want to like flub this one because I think it's so important because this is Rachel trying to come back uh, and basically be forgiven for her cancellation and I am not buying it. So that is that. Uh, and then if you, on their podcast, so on this podcast, Rachel basically says, um, you know, you can listen. We also did a podcast episode on my podcast. So they speak on her podcast today. I'm halfway through that one. It was so boring. It was like three rich people talking about their lives, like don't care. So that one probably won't be included at all. But what we will do today is, uh, is talk about Rich Talk. That's what we're going to watch first. And then we'll watch the end of the Tony Robbins interview because I left you guys hanging after part one. Now we have video and the video is so interesting. <laughs> the video is literally, this is what it looks like. This is not what I was picturing in the Tony Robbins uh, interview, like how I was picturing it. Like his, him is like this guru. He hates fat people, but then look, Twizzlers, Swedish fish, kisses. It's like, I thought this was a guy like uh, Mike Tyson doing like some sort of substance it's him kissing a bird that took me like a solid 30 minutes to figure out what the heck it looks like he's smoking a pipe or something anyways um we'll go there but first we're gonna watch rage talk episode six i have not seen this yet and as promised usually on tuesdays we listen to the podcast and watch rage talk so that's what we'll be doing so basically the rundown is dave's back sort of I'm gonna do talk about the Skinny Confidential podcast tomorrow in a non-live version. We're gonna watch Rage Talk and then we'll watch Ty Robbins. Applause for me. I have put together a schedule. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Uh, uh, based on the uh, thumbnail of this and the uh, description, uh, hello, Heidi. Heidi, not Powell. Heidi Hansen. I like it. Welcome. Uh, Ford's first heartbreak concerns me. Ford is her son who's like 
10, nine or 10. Uh, don't love that. I give Rachel a lot of credit for keeping her kids off social media, yet here we are. Don't make me take back the compliment, Rachel. Don't make me do it. But also, but also, don't make me do it. Okay, let's begin. Hey guys, welcome to Rach Talk, my weekly show where I hang out at home and talk about anything and everything. Today we are chatting through TR, no, well, what are we even talking about? Okay. <laughs> Today we are talking about the one year anniversary of my first kiss with Boo. I'm telling you all about these, these pins. We're remembering Total Request Live. Can we get a minute for Carson Daly? And oh my gosh. Ford has had his first heartbreak. Okay, intro done. We have survived. Uh, we just had the first anniversary of her and her boo. So boo was mentioned with before the minute mark, which is I think a record. And I don't have the boo sound effect. I'm so sorry, I should have checked on that earlier. Uh, we have a boo mention within 40 seconds or less record. Uh, we've already talked about on Rage Talk, we've already explored and lived the one year anniversary of them texting for the first time. Now we're going to move on to the one year anniversary of them kissing for the first time, listening once again to the world's worst story of a 40 year old woman describing an emotional connection with a man. <laughs> I guess a physical connection with the man. Uh, that story haunts my memories. There is a video on my channel about it if you'd like to uh, live through it. That was basically my, that was my second. Oh, thank you. Stuck with Sassafras, thank you for subbing. Um, that video haunts my dreams and uh, was basically my foray into covering Rachel Hollis in more depth because I had done one story about her cancellation uh, because of the toilet gate stuff, but that, but then she was gone and I was like, okay, that's the only video I'll do. And then she came back with that, like, I kissed a boy story. And I was like, oh God, this is so interesting. <laughs> Why is she doing this? And here we are a year later, still talking about how interesting they are. Uh, okay. So that's the intro. Ford has a heartbreak texting, no kissing anniversary and some other random stuff. Sounds about right. Sounds like we're at the right channel. This is basically what Rage Talk is. Nonsense. Okay, continue. Here we are. Back together again. Back at Mi Casa, es su casa. I don't know where Jeffrey is, but I'm sure he'll be around any minute to come cause trouble. Where is he? He didn't run away. Did you let him run away, Jack? Not this time. Okay, great. I know, I'm sure he's, he's probably taking a nap. He's got a real busy schedule. It is a glorious day in Austin, Texas. And now, here's your local on the eights. The high today is sunny and 72. All right, that is spectacular. Uh, okay, whatever. Um, just commenting on her outfit and stuff. Uh, chambray, I know she used to have Chambray Wednesday, so she's bringing back the, sh is that how you pronounce it, Chambray? And she's got a lot of pins that you can buy from her website, ironically enough. Um, and also Jack is being accused once again, free Jack, uh, from <laughs> causing uh, the weather to, or Jeffrey's absence, of course, is Jack's fault. Come on, Jack. We're rooting for you. Stand up for yourself. Okay. Tomorrow, we've got a 100% chance of rain with a high of 55, okay? Texas is crazy. It's crazy and I made a really big rookie mistake in that I thought, I thought, Jack, that spring was here. I have a courtyard, which makes me sound like I'm the queen of England. I'm not, I just have this like square in front of my front door. And that square when I moved into this house was gorgeous. Like seasonal, seasonal, tropical, local, What's it called when it's like a, you're in the area and the plants are in the area? <laughs> Indigenous? Seasonal? Local? Seasonal. 
some kind of grasses, grasses that are meant to be on this land. Okay, it was beautiful. Native? Can't, uh, is the substance so low that we can't cut this part out because it's not interesting? No? Okay. Don't, I've lost, it's been lost in translation because of what she's even trying to say is lost because I have no idea. It's been too long. She has, hasn't come up with a word in time. That happens in everything that she does. She's like, what's the name of that show, that movie, that actor? What's the name of that word that I'm looking for? Like, I get it, it's cutesy, it's kind of like, I'm just like you, I'm relatable, you know, hashtag relatable. Uh, but it be after a while, it becomes like, uh, you're wasting my time. Had a lemon tree, you guys. I had a lemon tree, big and bountiful. Did you ever get lemons from the lemon tree, Jack? You missed out, bro. Then, winter of 2021, you may or may not recall, we had something in Austin, Texas called Snowmageddon. <laughs> Storm Stories, tonight at 8 on the Weather Channel. Which was this freak winter storm. We were trapped in the house for like 10 days. We lost water and power. It was a whole thing. Did you, you lost water and power for how long? Five days. Five days. Uh, it, it would just... This episode so far is quite Jack conversation heavy. Seems to be like she's forgotten that this is recorded and going out to people who may be interested. This is just a conversation with Jack about the weather. I'm bored. It was a catastrophe. One of the losses of that experience was the lemon tree and most of what was growing in front of my front door. So then, you know, nature, she knows what she's about. I did lose a lot of plants and a lot of trees, but the courtyard sort of came back. It found its way. Some of those, whatever they're called, grasses came back. They started to flourish again. It didn't look like its former glory, but it looked pretty good. Then this year, we had another freeze. And that was when all of the plants in my courtyard said, life's too hard, okay? Peace, I'm out. I can't be here, I can't do this. I don't want any part of it. And for a very long time, the front yard has looked rough. It's looked roof. It's, it's embarrassing. So Boo and I decided that we would start to, you know, clean her up, get her going, plant some new things. Someone's gonna comment on this. <laughs> You're so unrelatable, Rachel, that you don't have a landscaper that comes to your house twice a week to prune my lemons. And I said, well, I don't wanna have pruned lemons, bitch. <laughs> That's gonna be her next viral video. And then in a year from now, she's gonna go back on the Skinny Confidential and she's be like, people just don't get it. They're not me. I was like trying so hard to like be the super woman for everyone. It's not my fault. Okay, we got a second boo thing. Why, how is this relevant to anything? I don't know what she's gonna say next, but like the fact that you have a lemon tree that you need to clean up your yard, why, does it, why do you have to bring up your boyfriend? He suggested it, who cares? Okay, let's go back a second and then we'll start again. Decided that we would start to, you know, clean her up, get her going, plant some new things. And we had, you know, we'd gone through the freeze and it was like, we were averaging what? Like 70s, high 60s every day for like days and days and days. We say spring has sprung. We're here for it. We're a little farmer girl and boy out in the front yard planning things out. No sooner did we plan out this front situation. And we didn't just plant the grasses, y'all. We invested in some trees. You know how much a tree costs? A baby tree this tall, you know how much a baby tree costs? as much as Jeffrey's dental work, okay? That's, how, that's her comparison for everything. The tree is the same as Jeffrey's dental work. The bottle of champagne, same as Jeffrey's dental work. How much is Jeffrey's dental work? And also, but also, hold on. I have to physically touch the button now. But also, who cares? Are you complaining or what? Like you bought a tree, good for you. Why don't you put a seed in the ground? It's the same thing. Takes a little longer, It'd be a little harder for you to do, but you know, you, no one, no one's forcing you to buy a thousand dollar tree. Ah, oh, thank you, Just Jake. A Big Mac for me. <laughs> thank you. Oh my God. Uh... Unfollow me. I don't eat meat, Jake. How dare you? Uh, why well, I, I eat chicken and turkey, and I love the Impossible Whopper. So. 
I will take that super chat money and go get an Impossible Whopper later because I have been craving one. So thank you. I'm just kidding. Don't unfollow me. Please. I need the support. Okay. <laughs> Back to the show. Okay. It's expensive. Expensive trees. We bought them. We planted them. We're so proud. He's like, man, this relationship's for real. We're planting trees. Two days later, 25 degrees at night. You want to know why there's sheets and burlap all over this courtyard, Jack? It's because Boo, like a terrified mother, bundles all of his trees, all of his plants, even the low ones that probably shouldn't be affected, covered everything in the courtyard. And it's supposed to freeze again tonight and tomorrow. Don't worry, it'll all be bundled up again, okay? He releases them during the day so that the sun can touch their leaves, bundles them up at night. He watched YouTube videos, he Googled it. Yeah, I think I think everyone in the comments is right. I think this is a signal to the haters and probably more more so Dave. I think I think Rage Talk is her talking to Dave. That's what I've decided. Uh, I might change my mind. I have a feeling that everything that Rachel does and everything that Dave does still to this day is to communicate with each other and to compete with each other because that is how they both have found success in their lives at one point, not so much anymore, but uh, having that constant competition, like they literally own a company or at one point did called 3% Productions, which was Dave's passive aggressive way to tell Rachel that uh, she you know, wasn't good enough to get a job or whatever. Uh, that's how petty they both are. So I believe that Rage Talk is 100% designed not to inspire women, like she says, or to create content that is, you know, engaging or relatable because we all know it's not that. We've, it was five minutes already and we've talked about a lemon tree that her boyfriend and her bought and put in the ground. Like, okay, what are we doing here? This is just to tell Dave, my boo thing moved in, asshole. That's what she's saying. <laughs> Dave being the asshole, not the boo thing, because how, you know, heaven forbid uh, there was a bad word spoken about him, even though she's alluded to several things that I think are sort of red flags. Uh, do I have that one? Nope, I don't. Dang. Uh, anyways, let's continue this riveting story about the lemon tree that boo thing in the morning, because he lives here, uh, puts burlap on. It was very upsetting for him. For me, I'm like, they'll be fine. But if we lose this little Japanese maple over here that costs more than a used Miata, the place will not take it back. They had a big sign that was like, we are not responsible if you kill this tree. That's She's used this also, the, symbol, the used Miata. It's, it's like to show how rich she is. It's either this thing cost me as much as a used Miata or Jeffrey's dental surgery. I've already heard that twice in the six episodes of Rage Talk that we've watched. It's like, get it, uh, whatever. That's where we're starting. But what I'm saying to you is before it gets cold again, it's a beautiful day. And that matters because it is my anniversary. It is my one year anniversary. And I know what you're saying, Rach, didn't you recently do an episode where you said it was the one year anniversary? Yes, but that was the one year anniversary of the first time I text him, okay? Today, Jack, is the one year anniversary of the first time we kissed. <laughs> and I think I've told you this story. I think I talked about it last season of Rage Talk, but I want- That's something I also ticks, ticks me off, grinds my gears about Rachel. And she did this a lot in the podcast, the Skinny Confidential podcast that we will talk about tomorrow. Uh, just a reminder. Um, she says, I think, I think that's what I said. I think that's what it was. It's like, how come I know what you said and your fans know what you said verbatim, but you think you did a video about, are you that popular and busy and cool that you can't remember full on? It's like, not like she's making a ton of content these days. In the last two years, she's made like six episodes of Rage Talk last year. She's made six so far this year. I mean, I remember basically everything I've said in all my videos to a point. I mean, I know she's busier than I am, so it's not a fair comparison, but I think she says that just to make herself seem like disconnected from the content. Like I put stuff out there and I leave it and I don't really like know what I say. I'm so kooky. That's how I take it because 
that video is, like I said, ingrained in my brain forever in which she described her kiss. <laughs> Check yes or no. And she did that voice the whole time where she was like, and maybe we'll watch it after this, just a portion. But she was like, I, I kissed a boy, everybody. It was so jarring and bizarre that the fact that she wouldn't remember it, I don't buy that. But let's continue. I want you, I'm just gonna paint a picture for you. Those of you who are new or maybe you need to hear the story again. When I, ki no, I didn't kiss Boo, he kissed me. The first time we kissed, one year ago today, he was the second man in my entire life I ever kissed, okay? At the time I was 38 years old, it was almost like the movie Never Been Kissed, but I had been kissed. It was like slightly been kissed, but only by one person. Do you, Okay, I'll give you the whole story, because you asked, I'll give you the whole story. So, remember how I told you guys last no. week that um, we played the question game? Remember the question game, Jack? So that was like our thing for a while. Like, we'd go, you know, whatever, and it was the first time he ever came to my house. Now, again, in this scenario, we are friends. Now, I know that I have a crush on him, but I don't know how he feels about me. And I also have no, like, you know, like, what's the word? Common Indigenous sense. grasses. I didn't have any, like, not moves. Like, I didn't, um, you know, like the cool kids like would know. I feel like there are people who would know, oh, this person's into me. I don't have those skills. I felt like I was in third grade. Like I was like, should I walk up and like punch him in the arm and then run away? And that's how he'll know. Side note, Ford Hall. Mm. This is very relatable. Uh, yeah, as someone, once again, I'll remind everyone that this is a woman who was giving out advice for thousands of dollars uh, to other married couples about how to have an exceptional marriage. Yikes, stripes, beech nut gum. I am shocked. Not really. I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised anymore. Now that I've realized that I've uncovered all these self-help grifters rule books and blueprints, it's not shocking at all. It's just disappointing that a lot of people believed in her, believed that this was a person to emulate, to, to look up to, to believe in, and this is the truth behind it. She thought like, oh, if I need to kiss him, if I'm interested in a man, the best way to do it is to punch him and run away. I know she's being facetious, she's not being serious, but the fact that she's even playing this role as someone who has no clue how to speak and communicate with a man that you're interested in, in a healthy way, but then also dispense advice for thousands of dollars is disappointing. Flat out. Paul has told me that he ran into, did I tell you about his ex-girlfriend? Did I tell you this story? Oh. I really want to tell this story. But I feel like I shouldn't out him. Um, one of my children, his name is Schmord. It rhymes with Schmord Hollis. Schmord Schmollis. I don't, he's nine. I don't know how this could get back to him. F came home. Okay, uh, I'm sure nine year olds, and she's talked about how he has Fortnite and all that. You know, they're not like pagan children living without internet in her home. Uh, don't underestimate nine year olds, especially Ford, who's extremely in intelligent based on what I've seen and the stuff, the, you know, the content that Dave has released that is embarrassing for him, Dave. Uh, Ford always comes across as a very intelligent, smart young man who's wise beyond his years, to be quite honest. And I feel badly for him that he has to be put himself on the internet to get attention. So it seems, you know, that his dad will interview him uh, for co paid content. And now here we are, Rachel Hollis, using Ford as paid content on the internet, because even if you're not sponsored, this video isn't sponsored, she's still getting AdSense from it, therefore monetizing her, once again, relationships in her family. All right, let's hear the story. Like, yes, he can see this. His friends can see it too. It's not like, oh, it's never gonna get back to him. Yes, it will. That's the whole point. Home, uh, six weeks ago, elated, joyful, just ready to burst. And Ford is my most feeling child. He is 
deep in his feelings, and he has been since he was little. In fact, I have a video that I will send you of him. He wanted like an ice cube. He was like two, he wanted an ice cube, and I wouldn't let him have an ice cube because he's two and he's gonna choke to death. And he is sobbing his heart out as if I, I've, I've wounded him to his soul. How deep is a frog's home? I mean, how, how, how? I mean bath. I don't know, how deep is it? A hundred. A hundred, <laughs> you're hilarious. So Ford Hollis rolls in the house, he's elated. It must be big because you know, he's not always this, you know, pumped up. I'm like, what, what's going on? He's like, I have a girlfriend. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, fourth grade is going off, do tell. And he's like, well, honestly, mom, I don't know how long it's gonna last, cause, <laughs> Ford's smarter than Rachel when it comes to uh, being realistic in relationships. <laughs> I'm telling, my goodness, Kitty, relax. Sorry, Taro is, she doesn't like when the desk is up and I'm standing. She wants to be able to lay on the desk across my keyboard because it's work time. Therefore, it's time for her to blaze about. Wanna say hi? No, okay, sorry. Uh, that was a break in our programming. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> I, I see everyone's comments. Yeah, this is gonna live on the internet forever as well. So you think when he's 16 that someone can't go back and search Ford Hollis and then see this embarrassing story of whatever. But again, he's got better sense than she does that uh, when a relationship may not last that long. Rachel's like, nope, every relationship that I'm in is gonna be marriage. That's what I think her mindset is. Okay, bye. Cause she, um, she has had a lot of boyfriends this year, but yeah, I'm the latest. She asked me out and I'm like, oh, well, that is great. And the whole week, he's just so pumped. You know, he's in fourth grade. So like having a girlfriend means uh, you ask them out and then they say yes. And then you never talk to each other again until you break up. That's what fourth grade relationships are. So he's like super pumped. He's like, I have a girlfriend all weekend long. We're like, yeah, cut to Monday. Okay. Monday which is Valentine's Day. Ford makes a special Valentine for his new girlfriend. Got her on Friday. I can't believe she's telling this story. I can't, I, I'm assuming that this ends in, uh, well, she says heartbroken, whatever. This is so embarrassing for him. Poor Ford. Save Jack, save Jeff, poor Ford. <laughs> That's my new motto. Friday, it's Monday, Valentine's Day. Gives her the Valentine. He comes home from school and I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? Did she love your Valentine? Whatever. Apparently, gives her the Valentine. Sister flips it over to the back, writes on the back, I don't want to be with you anymore, and gives it back to him. On Valentine's! You're as cold as ice. Thanks, Jack. Now I'm going to get demonetized for that. Jeez. Can't they learn? You cannot have copyrighted music on YouTube. Stop doing this. It's ruining my day. <laughs> okay. But I was like dying. I'm like, why is she laughing? She's like, ah, 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 this girl broke my son's heart. <laughs> it's like, okay, like, shouldn't he be more supportive? And also, don't put this on the internet, idiot. I'm sorry. Am I being or? Um, as Dave would say, it might be ornery, ornery, ornery today. <laughs> this is not okay. I get really upset and like fueled up when it's kids because they cannot defend themselves. Like he doesn't have the platform as a child that she does. And it's unfair that he has no control over what his parents do, especially in regards to his own story. It's embarrassing. What did you do? Because I'm thinking, we are framing this. We are keeping this. When this boy is 40 years old, we are pulling this. We're going to pull this out every year on Valentine's Day because that's hilarious. I'm sorry. I don't know what you think is funny, but if you don't think it's funny that a nine-year-old got his Valentine's, wrote that on the back, and gave it back to him, like, just straight zero Fs give it. Like, what? That is some cold-hearted. So... I'm like, what did you do? Where is it? Like, what'd you do? And he said, oh. How's this funny? I ripped. Thank you. Fast as you can. One. <laughs> We're stopping. Uh, just need a little break. 
should I go back? I feel like I saw it, but not because I stopped it. I'm so sorry. I stopped it a lot. My bad. She's like, how could you not find this funny? How is this funny at all? Like, I know it's well, people will say, well, it's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. She's just making fun of her child. It's like, yeah, but also, but also, uh, it's not funny. Not even in the slightest. What the, f what is she, like, if you were, if, if her, if this was her daughter doing it, I could see like, oh, wow, my daughter's like cold. Ha ha ha. Like, that's just her personality. She's very, you know, she's very, uh, you know, whatever, forward or something about stuff. That's one thing. But being the recipient of a note that says, oh, I don't want to be with you. It's so funny because he's nine. I don't get it. What's the humor? Let's go back just a little bit. I want to just re, I want to re-traumatize myself by watching this part. Out every year on Valentine's Day because that's hilarious. I'm sorry. I don't know. Go back more. Gives it back to Okay, I gotta skip over the coldest ice part because that's gonna screw up my channel. Okay. And we are framing this. We are keeping this. When this boy is 40 years old, we are pulling it. We're gonna pull this out every year on Valentine's Day because that's hilarious. I'm sorry. I don't know what you think is funny, but if you don't think it's funny that a nine year old got his Valentine's, wrote that on the back, and gave it back to him, like just straight zero Fs give it, like, what? That is some cold hearted. So like, what did you do? Where is it? Like, what'd you do? And he said, oh, I ripped it into a thousand pieces and I wish that I could have thrown it into the fiery depths of hell. I, I sh you not, Jack. I do not know where this kid gets his dramatics from. I wish that I could have thrown it into the fiery depths of hell, but I couldn't, so I threw it in the trash can. <laughs> what is going on in his class? Okay, so anyway, then he's like... <laughs> uh, this is worse. I always say every episode, this is the worst one. This is the worst one. This is the worst one. It involves her kids. I'm against that. Talking about them at all. Leave them out of it. Uh, now she's laughing at his misfortune and making it his personality. Oh, it's, it's me who's dramatic. Ha ha ha. And we're going to take the frame. We're going to frame this disappointment in your life and talk about it for the next 40 years. So you can be reminded that some girl in your class turned you down. I, am I just too poor? Is this rich people humor? Is it, is it like once you get hair extensions and move to a mansion, like your, your humor changes? If so, let me know. He's like bummed because he feels rejected. I'm like, with respect, with respect, <laughs> you literally got this girlfriend on Friday. I never heard about her before. You you were together a sum total of like seventy two hours. I know this was harsh. It'll. This is a woman who's doing this episode about a one year texting anniversary. How could you be that disconnected from reality? Oh my god, she is so insufferable. And I like again, I don't know Rachel in real life. This is all based on the content that she puts out there for people to consume to judge her obviously you're putting yourself out there you're putting yourself up for judgment why would she want this to be her personality she's trying to be like the bad okay she does a whole episode on mean girls oh are you a mean girl not like me i i take everybody's concern i don't judge anyone i i am like the most sweet kind most positive woman ever like these are the words and the way she describes herself meanwhile she's telling a story about how she's laughing in hysterics about how upset her son is and how dramatic he is and how ridiculous it is. It's like, they, your kids just went through a divorce publicly. The whole world knows about your parents' divorce. Your husband, ex-husband is in some treatment facility. Have a little bit of compassion for the kid and leave this off the internet. This is so mean and ridiculous. And how does she think that this is a good content to put out for anybody at all? She's losing it completely. Like there's no hope for her, regardless of coming back, in my opinion. This is double, triple confirmation. <laughs> there's no hope, she ain't coming back. It'll be okay. Fast forward to last weekend, he's at his brother's baseball game and he runs into her, okay? She's there, the baseball, and he's like, mom, I ran into, I'm not gonna use her name. 
He says, I ran into sister. Well, that sounds weird. It's not a sister. I ran into ex-girlfriend at the baseball game. And I'm like, what? It, okay, how'd that go? And he said, oh, I went over to <laughs> And every time I would go up to her and I'd get real close, I'd be like, me, 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 me. <laughs> He would just go into her space and just do that. <laughs> and I was like, Ford, no, sir. First of all, respect personal boundaries. Secondly, what was the end game here? What was the end game? Did you think that that would make her like you? Uh, a wild hand gesture and a hamster sound. She appears to be transfixed. That This is so, I feel so bad for him. I mean, on the spectrum of severity in the grand scheme of the world, this is low. She's not abusing them. You know, I'm not saying that, but still embarrassing this is like if there was a greater good to it like this you know he got bullied and this is some sort of story to talk about his redemption and how he stood up to whatever maybe i could see like okay well it turns out well or whatever how about you handle the emotional training offline how about you tell teach your kid how to you know react to these situations because what you're telling him is it's a big joke who cares you're being silly. It just diminishes his capacity for having any sort of feelings or emotions outside of hers. You know? Oh, he's dramatic because he gets it from me. <laughs> Editing so it makes it look funny. It's like, uh, he's a human being. Whether he's nine or 90, he's still a human being and deserves respect. And this is not the way to do it. Was your, I was like, bro, you got to be cool. And I don't mean cool, like be a cool guy. I mean, just chill out. And I just remember. Also, chill out. How about you chill out? You're literally talking about how your boyfriend kissed you. <laughs> chill out, Rachel. Ugh. Remember, like, man, we are so dumb when we are in elementary school. We have no idea how to act around someone that we're attracted to. And that was me. A year ago today, I invite Boothing over to the house. And I don't know how this is all going to work out because it's like the first time he's been here and it's just like a friend. And just so you know, because it was a friend and because I was bound and determined to just be myself, I was wearing my holy sweatpants, which if you have been with me for long, you know my favorite pair of sweatpants. They have a bunch of holes in them. They're like 10 years old. I don't care. They look like garbage. This is not like, oh, I'm a Kardashian. I like cute in sweatpants. No, this is like dumpster pants that I wear around the house. <sighs> yeah, we know. Dumpster pants. Cool. Uh, this is also last episode. If you remember on Rach Talk, she said, clothes are a reflection of you. And when I wore this cocktail ring, when I was having postpartum depression, it made me feel better. So therefore, the lesson that I've always learned from that experience is to wear clothes that make you feel good about yourself. And it's really a reflection of you as a person and what you wear and how you hold yourself. Flash, flash forward to one week later, seven days later, it's like, I was convinced to be myself and I'm just, I'm just me and I'm gonna wear garbage pants and like that's whatever because it doesn't matter. It's like, which one is it? Which Rachel, which advice should we take as viewers? None of it is the answer. Uh, but if you were someone who was genuinely watching this content for non-snarking purposes, which there are people who do, allegedly, um, I would be confused. Like, wait, am I supposed to buy clothes that I, I feel good in? that I take risks on? Am I manifesting money correctly because I'm buying this cover up that, you know, I'm gonna have faith in the universe to provide? Or should I wear garbage pants to meet my friend boyfriend? It's like, she doesn't even know what the heck she's saying ever and definitely not anymore. It's getting worse. <sighs> okay. So I'm wearing dumpster pants. I think this is all to tell that like, it wasn't my looks that he's attracted to. It's my personality. My personality is the best personality ever. And like, no one would ever leave me. So like, just because Dave, you know, found someone else that's attractive, like, uh, it has nothing to do with me. It's like, no one thinks Dave made the right decision, I don't think. <laughs> Even Dave's family looks like they don't, they don't think he did the right thing. So you don't have to like, explain like, oh, I was, it's not, looks don't matter to me. Like, I don't care about looks. It's like, my personality matters. It's like, okay, but do this again this is all this is like her journal entry and maybe that's what it is and like if you want to create content and that's a journal entry and post it online fine
but I just don't understand why anyone would pay her to give advice ever again. Socks, Birkenstocks, an oversized t-shirt, and a hoodie. Because he's just coming over to like hang out and have a drink and whatever. So we're sitting on the sofa. I'm on one sofa. He's on the other. We're doing the question game. And I don't know where I got the courage to just decide that I was going to at least make it clear. I thought I might shoot my shot and absolutely crash and burn, but I will not miss out because I didn't have the courage to just make it clear to this person that I liked him. So one of the questions was like, there was some kind of setup. It was like something, what's something you haven't done in a really long time that you hope to do this year? And I was like, make out with someone. <laughs> because at that point, I had not touched another living soul in a romantic manner in a very long time. And I, you know, someone wants, yeah, I want someone to like pet my hair and give me a hug and tell me I'm pretty. And so I was just hoping that within the next year, that is something that would happen. So the, that was the answer to the question. I was like, I hope that I'm gonna make out with someone, ha ha. And he kind of like looked at me a little bit, but I was like, I don't know what that look means. We're fine. It's fine. But I knew that like, it wasn't, it was still too subtle. Okay, because in that scenario, it could be anybody. So then big ups to whatever spirit guide made this happen because... Here we go. Spirit guides made this relationship happen. Therefore, we can never break up because the spirit guides made it so that we made out and blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, this is all new information, by the way, to me at least. Uh, this was not part of her original video that, you know, she had preemptively said, I want to make out with somebody. And then she winked 25 times and then he got uncomfortable and she's like, okay, <sighs> I shot my shot. Um, she told the story as if like, she was just like, oh, come over and randomly he pulled me in and held me close and it was just meant to be. It's like, okay, so you also, everything that she says about her boyfriend that I've heard the her say, it starts with, she's like, oh, I went to this concert with my boyfriend. But then she, you hear her talk about it. Well, it's like, well, I invited myself. Well, we made out and it was this romantic thing that I set up through the question game. It's like, she is the one directing and it seems like almost p pushing him into this direction. And maybe, I don't know about him at all. I don't know. Maybe that he loves it. Maybe that's the type of guy he is. Who knows? I only got her side of the story because he has a career outside of telling life stories about yourself on the internet. Uh, good for him. <laughs> Can't relate. Um, but yeah, it seems like she is having this relationship almost on her own or she is not letting things manifest in her own definition of the word manifest. She is forcing everything to happen with this guy is the way I see it, at least based on her, her stories. Later on, one of the questions is what's something I can help you with? And your girl, like stone cold, like, like Ford's ex-girlfriend, all the courage in the world. I was like, well, I did say that I really wanted to make out with someone this year. Oh! Oh! My drop! Like, I, a straight face, too, and I said it like I was pretty proud of myself. I didn't go like, <laughs> I didn't do any of that. Oh, you didn't act like a nine year old boy? Good for you, Rachel, because the way you made it seem in the last video where you talked about your first kiss is exactly how you portrayed it to be, so. <laughs> She's like, I sent him a letter, like, check yes or no. <laughs> oh, God. Man, she's got selective memory. I remember it all, Rachel, because it's on your YouTube channel. Like, just scroll back for one second and I can watch it again. And relive the memory. So, again, this is like her basically putting all the pressure on him. Like, okay, you know, I want to make out someone. I want it to be you. So he... And she's like, oh, I just wanted to be friends. I don't know. This whole thing is crazy. I don't know. Not crazy, but like... It makes sense now. All of it might make sense that she's the one constantly pursuing him, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But she makes it seem like, oh, spirit guides are for, like, we're so meant to be. It's like, uh, I would double check on that. Double check because the way you're making it seem, it seems like you're really pursuing him hard and he's like somewhat interested, maybe. That's what I see. Just my two cents. And he looked at me. He was like, like, it was like a light bulb. He was like, Oh, 
Like that that wasn't good. It, however he did it was like sexy and in an English accent. And he was like, oh, okay. I was like, oh my God, what does this mean? So the rest of the night I'm freaking out. I'm like, what's gonna happen? I don't even know. We're hanging out. I feel like I've, you know, I've, the ball is in his court. I have hit the ball across the net. It's in his court. And I go into the kitchen to get something. This is like at the end of the night. Cause he's like, oh, I'm gonna go. I'm going to the kitchen to get something. I mean, even talking about it's making my heart count. And I look and he's standing on the front porch. And I'm like, oh, it, oh, it's gonna happen. Thank you, Emma Kay. I appreciate that. I will keep going. I'll never stop. Well, unless the authorities get involved. But also, I will still want to continue. <laughs> it's too interesting. She represents like a whole, she, Rachel Hollis represents like self-help influencers generally and what women try and strive to be like, but then what they actually, like what the reality is. And I don't know if that makes sense, but she represents so much more than just herself. So I will never stop. I will never get a life. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. This is now it's now, now we're here where she's, he's leaving. I'm curious to find out what happens next uh, in this retelling of the story. Okay, so he's out there. He's leaving it open. If I walk out on that porch, we're kissing. And if I stay in here and be a weenie, we're not kissing. So I was like, oh my God, oh my God, okay, 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 we're fine. We're fine. We're going to go out there. And it was like the most beautiful, like the breeze was blowing and it was warm and the sun was, sh the sun wasn't shining. It was nighttime. The stars were shining. And I go out there and I just start babbling. Like, I'm like, oh, it's so pretty tonight. And da, 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 Cause I'm just like, da, da, whatever. And then all of a sudden, I mean, I could throw up. I'm so excited just thinking about this. And then all of a sudden he's kissing me, right? Like we're kissing. And I've told this story before on Rage Talk, but in that moment, my brain is like screaming because I don't know what to do. And I'm so confused. And I'm like, wait, wait, okay, wait, where do I put my hands? Do I put my, and you know, you just like get awkward and you're like Tyrannosaurus Rex and it's so crazy. And then I remember that I was like, wait, his hand, oh my gosh, his hand's on my butt. What? It's so crazy. Just as crazy as buying a woman a shot at a bar. It's crazy. Woo, it's so insane, guys. This was like the craziest, most precious moment. This is the craziest, most precious kiss ever. It's like the craziest thing. It's like, sounds like you tried to get him interested twice by saying, I wanna make out with someone. He said, okay. Uh, you could help me out with that. He said, okay. He was leaving and she followed him outside and was talking nonsense. So he felt like, okay, well, I guess I'll just, do what she's asking me to do. That's not as romantic as like, we had a moment, we connected, we kissed, we hooked up, whatever. Like a normal, natural scenario. And she's used this. She also did this talk at Rise. She talked about the first kiss story. So that, I mean, Rage Talk is monetized because it's AdSense, whatever. Um, she also sometimes puts it on the podcast, which, you know, her episodes, which is monetized heavily. And now Rise Conference costs like two grand to go to for some people if you bought it, like the VIP. So the story of their makeout has been used to, for her to make money several times now. Is this guy really interested or is this part of like, I need content, I need to, like she's hired this guy <laughs> to just be quiet and like make her image seem better? I don't know. I'm not saying that. I don't really think that, but like based on the story, none of this seems like a healthy relationship at all. Well, this is crazy. What do I do? It's like, and I'm just freaking out in my head. And all of a sudden he grabs my face and he says, baby, you don't have to talk. Which is the moment that I realize I have been saying everything that, what I just said that was in my head, all of that's come out of my mouth. His hands are on my butt, where do I put my hands? Do I, do I, where do I put my tongue? Do I put my, I'm saying those words. I'm so nervous, I am literally saying those words. You guys. I'm gonna sound like that. You guys. 
that didn't happen. Uh, unless you're having a mental breakdown, you're disassociating, that's a different concern if that's really happening. And also, why is he calling her baby if they're just friends, allegedly? This whole thing is so fake. But apparently, I'm cute enough because, you know, a year later, we're still kissing. So we got a big date tonight, which I'm pretty pumped about. And we're going to go to one of my favorite spots in Austin is this great, it's been there forever. It's called Perla's and it's on South Congress. Write it down if you are coming to town for a visit or if you live locally, you'll know what it is. But it's this great place to like sit on the patio and we got so blessed with this weather because it's gonna be cold tomorrow. So I'm real excited. <laughs> and did I arrange to shoot Rage Talk today so I would have cute hair and makeup for my date later? Yes, I did. I also she also said, <laughs> I'm glad that I can keep all this information in my brain because I have nothing else going on. Uh, she also said, I intentionally don't wear makeup. I intentionally wear makeup uh, for very specific reasons to show my audience that I can be whatever, whatever. She wore sweatpants and no makeup on the Tony Robbins interview specifically because her guiding angels made that so, but today we're doing makeup and hair because she's going on a date. What's the message for the audience? Only dress up, wear makeup when you have a man in your life? What's the intentionality? She's like, I just, I do this very intentionally. Okay, explain it, because I don't get it. Also want to take a moment to acknowledge my Texas tuxedo or my Canadian tuxedo, depending on where you're coming from. And more specifically, Jack, did you notice this pin collection? These are, some of them are from other places, but these are the collection of pins from Rise Conference over the years. And um, I mean, I have the original um, Rise ATX, which was like a button. We couldn't even afford enamel pins, 2017. And it's all like rusted and old. So this is not like a build up to be like, and we're announcing, no. Nope, no conferences on the in the future currently. But I just, I love this jacket. And I know that there are other people who also have enamel pins of like their history. So anyway, I just thought that I would rep it today for you guys. That is what this is all about. What else is going on? All right, guys. So there is, I had the idea for a new segment here on Rage Talk, or probably we've done this at some point. There's no way we haven't done this at some point. But a segment here on Rage Talk called, Are You Old Enough? <laughs> no, there's something about, I cracked myself up, I can't even talk. <laughs> I get it, it's performative. It's supposed to be like performing in the sense of like, she's gotta make content that, you know, you're, it's, you're on camera, it's like, like we all kind of know there's a difference unless you're doing something like this where you're responding, you're trying to be, you know, like yourself. You're creating like a fun environment. There's some room to, I'm laughing, to make it feel light and whatever, but like, it's like, okay, it's not that funny. In the beginning, she's like, I have a ring on. I have a ring on. It's like, is it funny or? Are we missing something? The whole thing is like, there's all the laughs that she's had in this episode at least, not warranted. About it, um, or um, oh, that's probably a better name than Are You Old Enough? But I, I don't mind it. Or maybe it's called, If You Remember This, It's Time For A Night Serum. He's killing me. He's killing me today. Jack, you are killing me. Sorry, I gotta put it. That's back. that's the title. If you remember this, it's time for a night serum. I would also. She's making it seem like she's come up with this. This is like very popular on memes and TikTok and Instagram. She's not the first person to be like, if you were, if you remember this show, it's time to wear an eye cream. This is like a very well known joke on the internet. She's making it seem like I've come up with this idea. This is my own idea. No, it's not. It's not. Like to bring back a moment from my youth. Let me, I'm gonna find out the exact date, one moment. Does it ever trip you out, anyone else but me, that everything is on the internet? Does that ever scare anybody but me, that there's nothing I can't get an answer to? 
there there's nothing yeah yes rachel yes 100 percent. no one's ever thought of that before <laughs> she's gotta be she's gotta be trolling it. like this is an actual troll right like this is the troll someone who definitely knows that that joke was used already people have used it before that other people are concerned about information being on the internet this is this is what a troll actually is they don't they like to say trolls and haters from people who disagree with them about their teaching or their methodology, methodology, whatever. But she's actually trolling us, right? <laughs> this is this can't be the real thoughts of a, of a successful woman, right? Thing that you could put in there that you wouldn't get an answer. I could make something up. How many years old is Xerbert the alien lord? I guarantee that answer is there. Okay, I got the answer to what I was looking for. So the year is 1999. 1999, which makes me 13. The ripe old age of 13. Thank you, Carla Bianca. V. Ravenez Hygram. Hyam. I thought it was like, at first when I saw your name pop up, I thought it was Carla Bianca versus Ravenez Hyam. Like you were in a court case against each other. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's awesome. I'll give you a, for that. I will give you a get a life. <laughs> so nice of me, right? But also unfollow me. <laughs> two nice things in a row. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry if I butchered your name completely wrong. That's my bad. Let me know how, how to pronounce it and I'll pronounce it better. But you have a log name, a cool name too. Thank you. Okay. Back to when Rachel was 13. And the thing to do after school was to watch a little show called TRO. Now, I don't know what's happening on MTV. I don't even know if MTV still exists today. It okay, must. Sure. But I don't know. I haven't watched cable television since like 2004. So it's 1999. And every single day, I would walk home from school. I would go into the kitchen and I would make myself a snack while in the den, I could see the TV that I had turned on to watch MTV, to watch TRL. And today, you could open up your social media, kids, and, and get access to any celebrity, any singer, watch it all go down. But we didn't have that. We didn't have a way to see what was going on with our celebrities unless we wanted to watch E! Entertainment News or MTV. So I would go on MTV to see like the videos, because back in the day, they actually played videos on music television and I would go watch videos and there was this show called TRL which is women men so Rachel's 39 uh yeah TRL was like my generation I'm 30 but how long was it on for 10 years because if like you like I see some people in the comments like she was 16 in 1999 okay I guess that makes sense how would she know that they don't play music videos anymore if she doesn't even know MTV exists? Hmm? Hmm? Wouldn't you just assume that it's still playing music videos? Ah, Sina! Thank you! Oh, you're from Canada, though. We don't accept Canadian currency here. Get a life. I'm just kidding. I'm from Canada. Unfollow me. Uh, but also... We love American dollars. American stinking dollars only on this channel. Okay? Get a life. I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, all right, back to Rach. And my age will remember. And it was Carson Daly, and all the people would line up and they'd scream, and, and it was like such a big deal. But it was a huge deal that videos would debut on TRL. And there was a show that I think was called Making of the Video. <laughs> there was a Making of the Video for this song, which I remember as a 13 year old girl thinking was such a naughty song and was going to get me in so much trouble if my parents ever caught me listening to it, which in retrospect is freaking hilarious. But I just am wondering if you were old enough to remember when this song was on TRL, when they did behind the video and the first time you ever heard this thing right here. Okay, we're just gonna let this roll. We're gonna let it roll. I've, I'm sure this has already been blocked from several copyrights. We're just gonna do it. Oh, thank you, Nikki Subber. Subber or Subber? Subaru Subber. You had a character appearing from behind a cloud saying, hi -ya! 
And for that, I say... Unfollow me. Get a life. I'm just kidding. Thank you very much, Nikki. Subber, suber. We'll find out in the comments in the next few minutes. I appreciate it. Okay, now we're going to listen to the thong song. A little Cisco, Jack. That's S-I-S-Q-O. Ooh, she played a bad word in her song and in her video. That's a bad word, Rachel. Look up the lyrics. Okay. Let's just, let's, uh, the thing is you have to, please, for me, for them, find the video. Because the reason this video is so powerful is that at the end of it, a dragon's gonna show up. And I am not making that up. If I remember correctly, Cisco jumps on a pyramid of people, which may have been actually all him, or perhaps his band, to fight the dragon. What if I made this all up? What if this is a fever dream? <laughs> Hold on. A thong? No, that's not how you spell thong. Hold on, now I gotta watch it. Now I gotta know. Come on, what's happening? Oh, I don't, I'm not, not on the internet, guys. Do this before you record. Do this before you record. Rachel, where'd YouTube go? It looks like a triangle. It's a red triangle. Oh, was it my fault? One of my fault. Nothing ever is. My team deleted the internet on my phone. It wasn't me that deleted, no. My team did that. I'm so, I, I apologize on behalf of my team for ruining this for us. Folders was flipped to the second page. That's not my fault, okay. We're back on it, here we go. Ooh, remember when his hair was bleached though? Okay, they're in the desert. There's a lot of buses pulling up in the desert. I'm not really sure why. I was like, if my parents come home and watch and find me watching this while I'm eating my bologna sandwich, I wanna see if the, the dragon is here. Isn't it funny though that like, the thong is what I thought was naughty? Today, the songs are like, I can't even say what the, I can't even, cause even a bleep, I feel like you could read my, and don't, don't get me wrong. When I'm here by myself, you better believe. You better believe there's some songs that come on. And when no one can hear me sing them, I know all the words. But 13 year old Rach thought the idea of wearing underwear that didn't give you a panty line was dirty. In case you're I mean, wondering what kind of house I grew up in. I mean, I think, the thong song kind of is a little dirty. I don't think of, I mean, I know thong necessarily is not like, oh my God, curse word, let's bleep it out. But it's not the cleanest song in the world. It's like, I mean, there's better, I like stories where it's like, oh, we listened to, uh, you know, Elvis and thought like, oh man, that was bad. Like that would be, I think, a better, like, oh, my house is so strict and conservative. That's the time. The thong song, I'm like, my my family was not conservative at all in that way. Like, didn't really care if I watched whatever. Uh, they would think that that song is raunchy. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Okay. This is so pointless. What's the point of this again? We're reviewing the thong song. Why? Where's Ricky Martin? Where's he? What's he? I, if anything, side note, Ricky Martin is more beautiful today than he's ever been. He is aging gloriously within one sentence contradicts where is he i have not heard of ricky martin he looks great have you seen him or not <laughs> okay i'm sorry jack your mom found ricky martin's garage door opener in what town okay well that makes sense look and now you just all found out that jack is uh what do they call it one of those kids trust fund baby <laughs> why can't i remember anything today Free Jack, question mark? Is Jack not needing this job? Oh no, what are you doing, Jack? Even more reason to escape. <laughs> you know what, because I'm on my period. The blood's coming out of me and also taking all of my thought process with it. I just did a podcast yesterday with a guest I've had on before and we were talking about hormones and cycles and all the things and how important it is for us as women to normalize a conversation around our periods, no. to normalize having hormones, to norm- This is something that Heidi Powell does all the time. Maybe there's a point 
in there that like you shouldn't be embarrassed about having a period but do i need to know about it as a person on the internet no i don't want to i don't want to i got my period it's like okay cool i don't know maybe i'm being weird maybe this is good for society i don't know i just i always cringe at it i'm like eh, so what so what do i need to know your cycle for what your spirit guides are guiding you towards the moon better than everyone else great awesome <sighs> okay normalize like it's this thing that exists for all of us and does our entire life but it's wrong or dirty or shameful or whatever and you're not supposed to talk about it and honestly i don't know jack you never had to do three videos in a row while you were bleeding out and cramping yeah, yeah so that's what's happening to me and it means that i'm not thinking as clearly as i want to be jack is not a trust fund baby salt of the earth he really isn't he wears the same shirt every day for like six years. He doesn't, yeah. Let me see. She is mean today. <laughs> I think people did not respond enough uh, positively to her uh, comeback, push the haters down podcast, Skinny Confidential maybe, and she's just in a bitchy mood. <laughs> I guess it's because she's on her period. Watch out, watch, fine. Good for you. I don't know. Let me know if I'm being totally insensitive because I just, like, I think the right time, right place, let's talk about our periods. Great. But just to be like, you know, bleed out while you record videos, it's like, I don't want to know about your medical history. I don't want to know about your periods. I don't want to know any of it. Sarah Bierman, thank you very much. <sighs> yeah, how do we get from PMS to the thong song? I guess we went from thong song to PMS because... Rachel gets her period, doesn't know how to spell thong. It's all, it all means something to her, allegedly. Uh, but also, it doesn't actually mean anything. And we're still, we're not even at the end yet. We have like less than 10 minutes, but still a significant amount of time left. Get a life. I can't, I won't, I refuse. Thank you, Sarah, I appreciate that. Okay, poor Jack, like, free Jack. I'm back to free Jack. I thought he had an out with this trust fund thing. He doesn't, so we're back to free Jack, free Jack, free Jack. He's gotta sit there and, and talk about, listen to periods and kissing and there's other jobs, man. There's other jobs. And, and outing him for wearing the same shirt, you literally talk about how important it is for eco-friendly, like, which I believe in, I think it's great, thrifting, all that. But she's like, oh, you know, buy from this online thrift store, buy this $600 sweatshirt that's upcycled as opposed to, you know, this guy's wearing the same shirt. Okay, but that's eco-friendly, so shut up. All right, I'm sorry, I'm done ranting, bye. Okay, so now, now they're like driving down the Miami highways and like they're in a, in a, a, a car that doesn't have a top, a convertible. Wow, Rachel, get it together. Do you think... She's very much Rachel in this episode, no longer Rach. So maybe the persona's gone. Think at this right here. Cisco thought, this is forever. Cisco thought, this is my life. I am Cisco, S I S Q O. I will be famous forever. I will be a hip hop star forever. I will have this bleached hair forever. Did he know that it would be a limited run, or did he think, this is it for me? This is who I am now. I wonder this all the time about people. And I've told you my theory. I feel like I tell everyone. I wonder this about Rachel. I feel like she projects. She gets so close to being like self-understanding or self-realizing, self-actualizing. Like she's describing her. Is she going to be this hot wife, mom, influencer, blogger, like woman empowerment person forever? Or does she know? That this was like, it's over, baby. <laughs> Let's go back just a little bit. I am now. I wonder this all the time about people. And I've told you my theory. I feel like I tell everyone my theory. All these people that we think are one hit wonders, are they though? Are they one hit wonders or did they just make a crap ton of money about a, 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 in a song about underwear and then they were like, I'm good. I'm gonna go live in Milwaukee. I'm gonna be good for the rest of my life. And it's been nice knowing you. I don't know. I'll tell you what, I don't care how classy you think you are. If you were at like a family wedding and thong song comes on and you don't just go, get out of here. Get out of my family wedding. Now let's get to the part where I think the dragon shows up. 
Yes. I didn't make this up. Yes. He's on a, yep. Oh, maybe this isn't with a dragon. Oh, okay, that song would be called Unleash the Dragon, which makes a lot more sense, to be honest. This song definitely doesn't slap as hard as Thong's song, but he does fight a dragon in this video, so winning. Okay, so every week on the show, we are celebrating. <laughs> hard transition. Uh, I guess she's not doing the turn anymore unless we missed that part. Oh, by the way, stand by for one quick second. I got the book that she recommended in one of the uh, other episodes, so I'm reading it. It's terrifying thus far. There's like a whole section on why your anus is uh, problematic and all of it's about your mindset, so. <laughs> Clench your anuses for that review coming soon. Okay, just wanted to point that out since I had it next to me. Okay. Reading a dream catcher. That's what we call it when someone within our Start Today community reaches one of the goals that they have been writing down for weeks or months or sometimes years. And this is this week's story. Hey guys, so my name is Amanda Klein and I have been using the Start Today journal for about a year and a half now. Um, the biggest thing that I have accomplished through my goals that I list on the Start Today journal is that I started my own company this year and it is now providing a full-time income for my family as well as funding our adoption of a little baby um, for next year. So that has been huge and has truly changed not only my life but our family's life. Guys, I love it, love it, love it when you Explain why you're sitting in a hotel room. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't want to make fun of the people who come on or who are not celebrities, but so she used the Start Today Journal to start a company and also fund her adoption. And now the company is supporting her family. Seems like a, a big uh, attributing to a big thing to attribute a journal to, which makes me feel like it's not real, but I digress. I don't know. You share videos about what you are achieving. I think it reminds all of us what we are capable of. It's really easy to see something on social media and think like, oh, that woman has, like someone helped her, or she has access or she has resources. And really goals are achieved by real people just like you who are focused and working hard and we wanna celebrate that. So please, please, please share your Start Today Dreamcatcher story. You can put it on social media and tag Start Today. You can use this hashtag or you can send an email to this email address. This one, somewhere here is an email address Jack is gonna put in later. And we are celebrating our Dreamcatchers by giving away Fabulous prize packs. Da -da 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 -da. I don't know why I did that song. I hate myself. Jack, will you like slide that little box over here so I can show some of the things Jack. that we're you you post your video Jack. or you send us your video and tell us the story of your dream catcher moment. And then we're gonna send you a box of cool stuff. Let's see what we got. Ooh, it's a water bottle. It's our finished strong water bottle. Shout out. I guess I should have like had these out and ready to go. We got our hashtag goals. These are, I feel like because they don't have the office anymore, they have to like liquidate all the things that they have to get rid of. And especially because they're not doing rise conferences anytime soon, as she just said not too long ago, they're like, okay, giveaway time, liquidation time, get rid of all the stuff that's in my house because they have sold their office in Austin. Uh, she has not announced that. I guess she will never because it's none of our business, but you know, uh, Good idea for a giveaway when you have extra stuff laying around. Okay, these are vintage. We don't even do these anymore. We've got our Not Sorry hat. We've got Start Today. Not Sorry in gray. We got all the things. Oh, oh my gosh. We don't even sell these anymore. It's the Not Sorry necklace. This was like huge. I wore this for years and we used to sell these at conference and these were massive. So there's a ton of stuff. Like yeah, we know she's not sorry. We know that. She said that in the podcast, the Skinny Confidential podcast, she said, I would do, that would make the video all over again, the Toilet Gate video. So she ain't sorry. <laughs> sorry, she ain't sorry. Like all of it's vintage that you can't get on the site anymore. But um, if you send us your video, then we're choosing one a week and we're sending you a collection of a bunch of stuff from the office just to like celebrate you and the <sighs> I thought we were gonna get through a whole episode rather. But anyway, send us your free Jeff. He just wants to play bald. Give him a break.
start today, Dreamcatcher story. We'd love to hear. I'd love to see what you guys are achieving and doing. And we would love to inspire other people. Oh, you know what I want to tell you guys about? This is pretty cool. So, I think it's cool. I started doing these weekly podcast episodes that are 10 minutes or less. So that means three times a week right now, I have a podcast coming at you because I'm just really focused on creating or trying to create the best content I can and to serve you really well. Okay, great. Well, why do we spend 32 minutes talking about Cisco for absolutely no reason? <laughs> I just really want to create content that is perfect for you and helpful while well, you ain't doing it on this YouTube channel. That is for sure. That's my impression of Rachel Hollis on Rich Talk. Well, and so I thought it would be awesome if there were things that were more bite-sized. If you don't have time to listen or get into a whole episode, you could just grab seven minutes or 10 minutes. So the first three are up. The first three are up, they're happening every single week she hates and Jeff. they're called a quick word. So it'll be like a quick word on friendship, a quick word on toxic people, a quick word <laughs> on how to achieve your goals. So check those out. They're airing every single Monday on the Rachel Hollis podcast. I feel like if this dog's gonna be here, he should have to dress up too. So basically what I'm saying is I'm gonna need you to also be the dog's wardrobe stylist. When you show up next week, besides setting all of this up, I'm gonna need you to have an outfit for Jeffrey. I don't need you to make the outfit to match mine. I'll match my outfit to what you create. Okay, great. Okay, great. I will give you his measurements later. Okay guys, thanks so much for hanging out. I hope that you liked this episode. I hope it made you giggle or laugh or just entertained you for a minute. If you dug it, please, please, please subscribe wherever you are listening or watching. Send it to a friend if you think it'll make her laugh. Okay, I'm over it. Over it. Over. Two. Oops. I'm over rage talk. A lot of people, I'm looking at the comments now uh, in the video. Love it. Makes my day to see these posts. Hi, I love this. Makes my day. So there are people who still like this stuff. Shocks me every day. Uh, yeah. I've listened to those quick take podcasts. It's like, patience is power, written all in caps. And it's like her just basically saying something Dave did that she didn't like. That's what it is, mostly. Uh, those quick takes are like, how did Dave screw up my life? <laughs> if you're interested, uh, I haven't been covering them because they're very basic and boring. So we know we don't do basic and boring on this channel. We don't do basic and boring on this channel. We only do exciting and fun. Uh, okay, so now let's finish the second half of the. If, if you can't stand to hear Tony Robbins' voice, this is your warning. Uh, it's coming up next. <laughs> um, this is the second half. Rachel does talk much more in this side. I will say, I will give her some credit for speaking up um, despite uh, the last time when he was overpowering the conversation. And definitely um, he still talks a lot, so fair warning. But uh, what the heck? What the heck is this room in his house? And you can see that, she, I think because they recorded it and she didn't put makeup on or whatever and like dress up in any way, uh, that's why she had preemptively say like, this was all intentional because this was a part of my brand and part of whatever. Um, oh, by the way, I'll have to find the clip again um, because I found the clip where she was basically saying to her viewers that, she didn't say Tony Robbins, but she said, you know, this really, this guy I met who's like my hero, he snubbed me twice. I found the, the footage um, and we talked about it on Cringe Fluencers, which is the other channel that I do with Camellia. And we talked about it in the last episode. So it's on there. Uh, in between watching this, I'll go find it. We can play it because it's very clear that he snubbed her and she was upset by it back then. <sighs> okay. Anyways. This, and by the way, if you can't see because it's far away, this is not a man doing uh, drugs. Oh, thank you, Luis V. No way I would actually watch Rage Talk and give her a view. So thank you for reaching out. Yeah, you're welcome. You are welcome. Anytime. Uh, but make sure to tell other people who don't understand you. Get a life. But also. Unfollow me. That's my favorite combination of those sound bites. <laughs> Get a life. But also unfollow me. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. 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 That makes more sense to me. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
Uh, yeah, this is not a person doing drugs. I thought that. I was like, what the heck? But it's a bird. He, Mike Tyson's kissing a bird. The meaning behind it, I don't know. Anyways, all right, let's go. We're going to hear more about Tony discovering cures for cancer and theories on fear and COVID. Here we go. Oh, my God. oh so many questions. My brain's going to explode. So for people who are listening to this, right, so maybe they're like, they're brain is also exploding, but they're at a more <laughs> basic level, right? Yes. The mom, soccer mom in Ohio listening to this podcast. There's so many tools that you have far beyond what's in here yes. that can just help her in her life right now that are about, like you mentioned earlier, the three questions that you're yes. going to ask yourself. Yes. Can you talk yeah, be happy listeners to. through that? So uh, years ago, um, when I was growing up, I grew up pretty poor in a rough life. My mom is the most important person in my life. She's now passed. Uh, but she had a rough time um, when she used uh, alcohol and prescription drugs. And so I became more of a social psychologist uh, because I had to be able to manage her states. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful. I, if my mom had been how I thought she should have been, I would. Don't get that confused. Going through trauma does not make you a social psychologist. That is not how that works. Just a fair warning to everyone. I'm talking about, I, I am not a social psychologist myself, even though I... Look at people talking. I am not an expert, so neither is he. Go to school if you want to become a social psychologist. Wouldn't be the man I am, so right. I'm beyond grateful to her. But as a result of that kind of tough breakdown or growing up, I had to try and figure out answers. And I had four different fathers, and we had times when there was no food. The reason I provide 100 million meals a year is not because I'm such a nice guy. It's like my family suffered, I suffered, I don't want anybody else to suffer. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a passion for me. But my life has changed because there's a knock at the door. I go to the door, this big guy's there. And my parents are shouting back and forth, saying things you can't take back. And the guy goes, he's holding giant groceries in each hand, like bag. And he had an empty pan with a frozen. Hold up. <laughs> I sweat a lot, to be fair. That's a lot of sweat. That's a lot of sweat for someone who is uh, superhuman and on 25 supplements. Or maybe that's what happens when you're on supplements. That's, that, it's hot. It must be hot in that room. My God. I didn't see that before. This is the first time we've had video. The first time we watched it, we listened to it on the podcast. Interesting. Turkey, uncooked turkey on the ground. He'd sit down beside him. And he says, your father here. And I was like, like we're not going to die. We had saltine crackers and stuff. But we weren't going to have a Thanksgiving dinner, right? And I was like... Just one moment, man. I go to my daddy. He and my mom are screaming at each other. You know, I got my younger brother, younger sister trying to get them out to hear it. I said, Dad, the door, the door. She got the door for you. He goes, you answer. I said, I did. He won't talk to me. He's here for you. And I was the most excited I can remember being in years in that moment because I just knew this is going to change Thanksgiving. We're going to be so happy. My dad opens the door, looks at this man, and got angry. And he goes, we don't accept charity. And he went to just close the door in the man's face. And the man's foot was down here. And so it bounced off his foot and stayed open, which made my dad matter. And then he, the man said, sir, sir, this is, I'm just the delivery guy. Somebody knows you're having a tough time. Everybody has a tough time. They want you to have a beautiful Thanksgiving. My dad said, we don't want to take charity. He started to close the door again, hits the foot again. My dad's getting madder. And then my this man said this, I'll never forget. He saw me, I'm sure I look crestfallen. And he said, sir, please don't let your ego get in the way of taking care of your family. I thought my dad was going to kill him. Veins in the side of his face were exploding. I'm just, and there was this long moment, like waiting for the bomb to ignite. And he just took the food and closed the door and never said, thank you. I was shocked. I was stunned. And I was sad. Like I was so excited. Number one, there was food. <laughs> Number two, we're going to have this family thing. And my father left our family shortly thereafter. And I, I carry his name. I had four fathers. He's the one that touched me the most. And so I was devastated. But about a year later, just as a kid, I started thinking this through. Like, what? How come I was so excited? And how come he was so upset? And I began to piece together. And now I've used this the rest of my life. So there's three decisions we make every moment we're alive. My, mad, my dad made him that day. So did I. But we made him differently. And the problem with these three decisions for most people is they're made out of habit. Like about... You know, if you listen to social psychologists, about 48% of what we do is habit. What's great about habit? You don't have to think. Yeah. What's bad about habit? You do the same thing. Right. <laughs> if it doesn't work, keep doing the same thing. So if you make these three decisions consciously, you can change your whole life. And I forget exactly what he says here, but I feel like he and also Rachel, but also Rachel, uh, they will tell this anecdote 
and then go into a study or something, but they are not necessarily related. He'll tell this whole thing, engage you, like, yeah, yeah, I follow, I follow, it's Thanksgiving, okay, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it, and then go, yeah, so anyways, uh, you know, 48% of people make decisions, every it's like, what, how is this connected? And maybe he brings it back, but I feel like a lot of times, because they both, they all talk so fast, and they go, zoo, 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 like, they don't always bring it back to what the heck the point was. So let's see. Thank you, Sabartlet. C Bartlett. Thank you for subbing. They're really simple. The first decision you make is what are you going to focus on? So what did my dad focus on? He had not provided enough food for his family. How do I know that? He muttered it, talked about it continuously. He was really angry. What did I focus on? Easy for me. I was just a kid, right? Food. This is amazing. <laughs> We're going to have this great Thanksgiving, right? So right away, whatever you focus on controls what you feel. So if you're thinking, oh my God, my kid's going to get killed or where are they or they die? You know, we've all done that. And then you're sick in your tummy and then they're fine. Right? right. You know, and you had all these adrenaline going through you and so forth. Right. So focus equals feeling, but there are habits of focus. So like if I asked your audience or ask you, what do you think most people focus on more? What they have or what's missing? What's missing? hundred percent. Yeah. And even overachievers focus on what's missing, Rachel. Yeah. Because that's why they're on the hamster wheel, no matter how successful they are, they're never fully happy. Right. How can you ever stay happy if you're constantly focusing on what's missing? You can't. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter what good person you are. It's like, think of it as software. That software will not make you happy. Yeah. It'll make you worry. It'll make right. you feel less than. It'll make right. you think you're not enough. It'll make you all. And it's just a habit of thought. How about this one? Which one do you think people do more of? Focus on what they can or can't control? Can't. Without a doubt. And by the way, in COVID, that's been magnified because there are lots of things we can't control. We can influence them, but we right. can't control them. But there are lots of things we can control. Thanks, Hollis Morgan. Hollis Morgan, are you an infiltrating member of the Hollis clan? Let me know. Uh, yeah, so she's getting, at least he's asking her a question like, yes or no, he does this to all his followers. If you, he, he'll, if you ever listen to Tony Robbins, it's like he'll say something very obvious or something he's like leading you to believe like, it's hard to be a man. Yes or no? Yes. Or he'll say, um, if you believe it's hard, it's hard to be a woman, say I, I, and everyone says I in the audience. So you basically, if you say nothing, it's like you're disagreeing, but because your impulse, your impulse is to like repeat the leader, you then are agreeing with whatever he's saying. He, he sets it up in that way. So he's like, what do you think, Rachel? People like focus on the can or the can't. It's like, can't. Yes. Right. Of course. It's like, he, that's not really a conversation that's like him leading her to say the thing that he wants to, her to say to then talk about what he wants to talk about. So conversation uh, is still lacking in this first part, I will say. Control. Yeah. Our weight, the most important things we can control, but no one talks about it, right? So when you're constantly focused on what you can't control and what's missing, you tell me what kind of emotions would that person have, no matter how smart they are, no matter how good hearted they are, no matter what a good <laughs> Christian or religious person they are, whatever kind of religion they have. What are they going to feel? Suffering. But so, so suffering. I would say, speaking of my audience, biggest issue she faces is anxiety. Oh, no and question. Everything that you just said is what's adding to that, right? Well, it's then let me add a third piece to the cake, okay? Which do you think people focus on more, the past, the present, or the future? Now, we do all three, but where do you think most people spend their time? The past. The past is, for people that are unhappy, it is the past. Yeah. For people that are stressed, it's the future. Future, 100%. <laughs> right? Most achievers focus on the future. It's actually great to anticipate right. the future. But when you're missing what's here, and then what makes it worse is when you get in a fear state or you're thinking about what's missing and what you can't control, right. then what part of the future do you create? You make up a future right. that's not a compelling one right. that creates more anxiety. Well, and your subconscious also doesn't know the difference between the things you're imagining, you which is it. what's giving you the anxiety. You got it. You got yes. it. So you have it directly in your head. So right. now you're living it. You're living that experience. So with my father, just go back to that for a second. He focused on, he had not taken care of his. Just a side note, I'm really not a fan of sitting like this. This is a very, I want to be relatable moment to me. It's like, I'm so comfortable with this. You know, I don't like Tony Robbins, so whatever. Like, I don't, you know, I think he deserves respect as anyone does on the planet. I don't think he's, you know, not deserving of respect. Um, 
but you know, even as someone who doesn't like him and his, I, okay, I shouldn't say I don't like him. I don't know him. I don't like his teachings. I think they can be dangerous. And I think he takes money from people who need to be spending money elsewhere, but okay. Uh, just beside all that, it's still disrespectful to me that she's sitting as if she's like a, a child listening to daddy tell a story or papa, <laughs> papa Robbins, as I have called him before. Uh, it's not story time in kindergarten, you know? Like if you're a professional entrepreneur, businesswoman, badass, mogul, sit like you are sitting at a business meeting. Maybe that's mean, maybe I'm wrong, but that's just how I feel in this moment. Like you're making it, and this is something we'll talk about too tomorrow when we do the Skinny Confidential podcast uh, video. You know, it's one thing to empower women to be boss babes and like to be taken seriously. I'm all for that, 100%. But then don't act like this. If you want to be taken seriously in, in a workplace setting, which this is a workplace setting, this is content that is made for money to be sold, I think there needs to be a level of respect, a level of professionalism. And if you want to you know, do it your way, that's fine. But I feel like you can't really then say like, well, we, we're not taken seriously. It's like, do you take yourself seriously? I don't know. Maybe that was like sexist of me or misogynistic in some way, but I feel like it makes sense to me. Let me know. Okay, back to this family. And that was the first decision. That alone would put you in a horrible place. Second decision is, what does this mean? So the minute you focus on something, whether you know it or not consciously, you can do it consciously, but most people don't. You go, what does this mean? Is this person attacking me? Are they dissing me? Are they challenging me? Are they coaching me? Are they loving me? Mm. Whichever answer you come up with will instantly change your biochemistry, right. you'll change what you feel and change the third decision, what you decide to do. Because if right. you're pissed, you're gonna behave differently than if you're feeling grateful. If something happens, did, is God, and it's not what you want, or it feels horrible, is God punishing me? That's what some people come up with. Is God challenging me? Is this problem a gift from God? Or is it nothing to do with God, I'm just a lazy little brat. <laughs> and I haven't done my part, right? right? Whichever decision you make will completely change your biochemistry, change what you feel, and then we get habits of these meanings, right? So then you feel the same thing over and over again, and then you think it's you. Oh, this is my lot in life. No, it's just a pattern you've done. It's just a habit. You can change the habit. And so think about it. So my dad is like, okay, I didn't take care of my family. What does that mean? I'm worthless. And what does that make him feel? Pretty easy to tell. How do I know he's worthless? He muttered in his breath for weeks before he left. And what he decided to do, leave our family. Mm. I'm worthless, I don't belong here. It was devastating. But I look back on it and it was the greatest day of my life because that's why I feed 100 million people a year. Because would I really cared if I hadn't lost that? Would I really care if I hadn't been through that pain? I'd love to believe I would, but I don't know if I would. Yeah. I, I care because I've experienced it. Right. So for me, it's not intellectual what people are going through. So those three decisions, you know, the third decision is what am I going to do? But just think, the meaning will equal the emotion, and the emotion is your life. Right. Because we have habits of emotion. I always call it your emotional home. Yes. Right? Oh, yes. Right? I'm not going to start quoting UPW to you because that would be weird. Go for it. <laughs> but um, I, Tell when, me. when you guys did the virtual one yes. last November or yes. something, because I was just like, I was talking to Dean. I'm like, I need something. And he was like, don't tell anybody, but we're going virtual. I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> So I spent a weekend by myself. So helpful. I'd gone through a year long divorce and I just needed that space. Yes. And it's funny. I'm going to sound like a stalker right now, but I think I've done UPW four times. Wow. And I've gotten awesome. like, I have all of my workbooks yes. and I have different notes. Could you go time. different stages? Yeah. You're dealing with something different. Yeah. But I, I it, totally. went the I'm going to sound like a stalker, but I've given you thousands of dollars multiple times. Yeah. Stalker. Uh, I think that's his ideal customer, Rachel going multiple times. Last one I had gone to, and when you guys did it virtually for the first time, you said, um, what's your favorite flavor of suffering? suffering that's right. And I was like, oh, fuck, oh my Meaning God. Meaning where do you spend the most time, right? right? Well, it, even though you know it's not good for you, yeah. you still go there, so yeah. that's a favorite like, flavor. One right? of my favorite quotes from Wayne Dyer is, um, when you squeeze an orange, lemon juice never comes out. Yeah. When something's under pressure, whatever is inside of it will come out. That's so will right. you talk about emotional home? Yeah. Because I'm not sure if the audience is as... And what I mean by emotional home, so that they know what we're talking about. First of all, thank you for sharing that with me. And I'm, I'm maybe for me, we can tell people about these digital programs because I have more moms now attending my seminar every yes, time in history. Because childcare is such an issue and they can't afford to travel. It is a huge deal. So... Trust yes. me, I, I just an aside for a second. 
imagine, because I know you know this is your mission. You're not doing this because you have to. It yeah. may, might be your business, but it's really your life. Yeah. Same for me, right? I don't have to work another day of my life. Imagine your entire life you believe God's made you for this, and you've done pretty well in helping people, millions, and the major way you do it is by immersion. Because if yes. you go learn a word at a time, like, you know, ask people, do how many learned a language in high school and right. college? How many still speak it? None right. of them, right? Right. right. But if I dropped you in Italy for six weeks and didn't even give you a teacher, that emer- you're going to come back speaking Italian, right? 100%. In a very different way. 100%. Yes, of course. Uh, prove it. <laughs> Send me. I'll go prove that I probably... My mom... Okay, this is on the side. My mom's lived in Mexico for five years. She doesn't speak Spanish at all. She can't order a taxi. She can't basically order at a restaurant. I mean, she's probably on the extreme end of refusing to learn. <laughs> Sorry, um, we don't have the best relationship if I, that's why I am the way I am. Anyways, um, but that's not guaranteed. Six weeks, you get dropped in Italy, you're gonna learn a language. I wish, I wish that's how it was. Uh, but this is to try to compare, like if you go to a conference versus do my online course, they're both great, they're both great. Don't get me wrong, buy both. But going to a conference, which costs you know 20 times the price, uh, it's gonna make you better. That's always the upsell. Like, come to the conference. It's going to make you so much, like, immersed in it, blah, blah, blah. So they don't want you to think, like, virtual's the end-all, be-all because you can't charge as much for virtual. People, you know, feel like they want to go and experience and, you know, be emotionally manipulated in person. It's much easier. No way, it'll be in you. So that's what I do. So all of a sudden, you know, we had the 60th birthday party, and my wife was amazing. I said, I don't want to party, and she's like, I'm putting on a party. <laughs> I said, well, party with a purpose. So we raised uh, $14 million and I added $5 million. So $19 million to save kids for Underground Railroad, which is one of my dear passions. Okay, Underground Railroad. He talked about this before. Um, there's so much controversy. I looked it up later because I was like, what the heck is Underground Railroad? I had no idea. Apparently, it's this dude, and correct me if I'm wrong, I only know a very little bit about it, but when I looked it up, it was under investigation by the state of Utah at one point, may, may still be, I don't know. Um, it was this guy who was going out and trying to rescue trafficked kids in other countries, but like there was very little evidence that there was, it's like this like a vigilante thing. This guy just goes to these other countries and tries to set up these sting operations. But like some of those other companies or nonprofits that do it with like trying to lure people in they very rarely, from what I read, it doesn't always end up with the people actually being prosecuted because it's like entrapment. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. This this like nonprofit. He gives he does. I looked at his tax forms for his nonprofit, Tony Robbins Foundation. He does give like over a million dollars a year to this organization. So he's telling the truth, but like it's not like he's giving to the you know Red Cross or something that has an established history of uh you know philanthropy this is like a dude that just decided to start this nonprofit with shaky ground i would say uh i have him on my list of like people to investigate and look into because it's quite uh interesting to say the least but this is the type of group he's supporting with his funds raven waves thank you so much 1797 are you a guru that's, that's 797, I love it. What a great number. Uh, sorry that you're sick though, I'm so sorry. But also, get a life. And, unfollow me. Don't really, thank you very much. I hope you feel better soon. I hope it's not the C-O-V-I-D word. And I hope that you are on the road to recovery and drink lots of Gatorade and whatever else may be soothing to you. Namaste. Okay. Uh, back to Tony telling about how amazing he is and how much money he's given to shaky organizations. So it was the most amazing, beautiful night. We're all in tears. We're saving these children's lives. And it was gorgeous and like a peak experience in your life. And then all of a sudden, oh, two weeks later or 10 days later, I'm supposed to do a seminar in San Jose. You went to a San Jose yeah. event, right? Yeah. So, you know, a stadium, you know, it's up for 15,000 people. I think we had 12,500 people in a few more weeks. So we do our normal 15,000 people. Governor of California decides, based on COVID, is very early days, change the rules, 10 people's the max that could be around each other. Yep. <laughs> 10. So I was like, everybody's like, was calling me saying, first they called me and said, are you going to shut down the seminar? I said, I bled out with mercury poisoning and got on stage in a wheelchair. I don't, you know, I'm not going to cancel something. But the <laughs> go- 
That's nothing. Dave Hollis bled out over Built Through Courage through tears. So bleeding out with mercury poisoning, small potatoes. Okay, Tony Robbins. Governor canceled it, right? Yeah. So what do I do? I was like, and I want to tell people this because a way of thinking. So I was like, screw that. We're going to Vegas. They're never going to shut down Vegas. <laughs> Two weeks later, they shut down Vegas, right after we moved the seminar right. there. Right? And I was like, okay, here's what we'll do. We're going to go to like 1,500 movie theaters and put 10 people in each. And I did this years ago, but not 10 people. I did a smaller number. But that way we can get everybody there. They can do it locally. They can still be around other people. And it's huge screens. It'll still be the dynamic you know, yeah. of what I create. Yeah. It's like a rock concert, you know, right? And so they shut down the movie theaters. So the last step was like, okay, I have a friend that has a church in Houston, 15,000 people. I'm renting this church. They're not. Okay, that point right there, he has a friend who has a church in Houston. He's talking about, now I'm not going to confirm, but here is how I think it is Joel Olstein. Like I said, when I went through his tax documents for his uh, Anthony Robbins Foundation, so that's all public information. You can look at nonprofits and where they spend their money. Some interesting things on there, but I don't want to talk about everything because I don't know. I need someone to help me read the documents. So if you know anyone, uh, send them my way that reads, uh, you know, charity documents. Anyways, uh, he gave a million dollars, I believe, some large sum of money, either 100,000 or a million to Joel Olstein's uh, church in Houston during Harvey, to be fair, but I'm assuming if he's giving that much money to him, then that would be his friend in Houston, right? That owns a church, I don't know. All alleged. Not gonna keep Costco open and shut down the church. Right. They shut down right. the church and kept open Costco. Right. I'm like, right. so then I was with Dean, thank God for Dean. Dean Graziosi was one of my partners and dear friends. Dean Graciosi is also a scam artist, in my opinion. Mutual friend of ours. Yeah. And Dean says, Tony, I, you know, I said, I got to find a way to serve people. Maybe I'll do this free seminar or something. He goes, I really think you got to do like a webinar. And I went and watched somebody do a webinar with like 252 inch screens. Right. And I said, I'll chop off my hands right. first. I mean, you know, like even in my event, it would be nothing like that. So we took out a tape recorder and I said, here's what we're going to do. And I said, we're going to get a building with 40 foot high ceilings and I'm going to build 20 foot high LED screens so I can see every pimple, every movement. I can see their children. If we're going to enter their home, I want to really enter their home. I want right. to be better than a live event. And I'm going to, I'm going to do a 50 feet wide, 180 degrees around. I'm put the best sound system in there. So it's like, like being in a stadium and I'm going to go to Eric Yon at Zoom and I'm going to get him to laugh so I can bring people up and see them. But I need to be able to bring you know, not a thousand people. That was the limit on Zoom. I said, I need 25,000 people. Right. And then I'm going to build an app and we'll do it where people can shake the app instead of clapping. And if one does it, you'll barely hear it. But if 10,000 do it, the place will be shaking, right? I want to make it just as real as an event. So I brought nine companies together and they're like, this is a huge project. I think we can do this in nine months. I was like, no, 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 nine. Conga, the conga line is here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for 36 bucks. Double support. Basically a million dollars. I like it. Uh, here's a tip for you, Conga. Get a life. And also. Unfollow me. But also. Most importantly. Get a life. Thank you for joining and thank you for that very generous donation. I will be putting it directly into my vigilante fund where I will personally stop all crime across America. Don't, don't fact check me though. In weeks is what you got. And we did it. Yep. And you went to one of them. Yep. But what's really cool, I've had a group of people follow me from Stanford and measuring my body over the years. It's pretty crazy what my body goes through in these events. But they started measuring the people in the audience. And since it was digital, I wanted to oh, see wow. how much of that would really transfer. Yeah. And you okay, wait. Okay, this part, I remember I was in my car and I was like, what the heck is he talking about? Okay, so he's saying that this is all, this, I believe this story is total bullshit. I mean, lots of the stories in here seem to be like, uh, but this one in particular. Extra BS. Also, <laughs> I see in the comments, Conga, 18 times two. Thank you. <laughs> now I understand. Double down. Got it. I even, I, I appreciate that even more. But also, don't forget. Get a life. Thank you. Okay, back to the story that I think is fake. Years. It's pretty crazy what my body goes through in these events. But they started measuring the people in the audience. And since it was digital, I wanted to oh, see wow. how much of that would really try.
So he's saying that these group of researchers were monitoring his body or have been monitoring his body for years to see what they go through during his events. So then they started monitoring the people's bodies, how and, and how they do this, I don't know. Now he's saying that they're gonna monitor people digitally. How? Blood pressure? Like blood sugar? Like what are you measuring? I need some information to understand what the heck the point of this is. Transfer. Yeah. And you know, people from first of all, 195 countries, but all of a sudden I got moms with their kids yep. and grandmas with their grandkids. Yeah. And I remember seeing this one Indian man, he was there with his turban on and his wife was there and he was really upset, you could see, because she'd commandeered clearly the big screen, right. right? And, but like 20 minutes later, he's kind of dancing and by the end of the program, he's fighting her for the piece of wood because he was right. a wood breaking piece. But they tested people around the world and saw the biochemical changes that I do in a seminar happen to them as well. Oh, wow. And 30 days later, they did measurements. This is during COVID. In their homes, the worst time, 70% reduction in negative emotions, 52% increase in positive emotions. And then they did 11 months later, not 30 days later, but 11 okay. months in the middle of COVID. They didn't do 12 months because COVID was like starting to open up. Same results for people. Wow. That's the changing in conditioning. Yeah. And they prove how what I do changes neurologically. What's your programming? How are they testing this? What what test do you check to see if people have neurological change? I'm all about learning about this. Like, let me know, but there is none. It's like, they these researchers have been testing people from home and they have higher positive and lower negative. It's like, okay, take, take your word for it, question mark? Yeah. The way you're wired. But come back to your question you were saying about is emotional home. Emotional home means how about a follow-up, Rach? How about a, wait, so tell me more about that. How did they measure from home as opposed to, wow, yeah, right, wow. How about you listen to what he's saying and ask a little, a little bit of a, a decent, so we can, your, your mom viewers from Ohio that you care so much about, uh, why, why it's beneficial if we learn about what the heck he's talking about. Not really, but you know, in her mind, I would imagine. Okay, back to it, I'll let it play longer. Maybe a metaphor to help your, your listeners or viewers. Have you ever uh, seen people on television, like let's say in New Orleans or Florida, or wherever, and then, you know, a storm comes or a cyclone and it destroys everything they have and they're picking up the piece of their life and they're with their children and your heart's breaking, you know? And then three years later, they rebuild what happens again. And in some cases, it happens again. And there's some point where you might, no matter how much compassion, you go, why don't you move? Right. <laughs> like, you know, why don't right. you do something? They don't move is because what they know. Yeah. And we all. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what I think that mess of words was is, okay, New Orleans had Hurricane Katrina and everyone says like, why don't you move? And they're too afraid to move because it's what they know. Uh, no. How about you can't move because it takes money to move somewhere. And once you have a developed community with family members and such, like you're taking care of a sick relative or something, or they are getting older, you can't, now everyone has the luxury of flying private across the universe like tony robbins does so out of touch yeah that's what's holding you back from moving away from new orleans uh after hurricane katrina is your mindset and like oh you're too afraid because that's what you know give me a break i'll have an emotional home a place we go back to no matter what happens in our life and some of those homes are not real happy and you know when your conditioning growing up was not so great mine was part of that too you tend to go to not great places. Right. It's like people picking the wrong partner, do all these things. Is they're trying to get back to that feeling. Right. And so what I- Because is there, is there safety for them and the certainty There's of certainty. Yeah. It's not, it's not always safety, but there's certainty. And even when it's painful, there's comfort in what you know. Right. Right. The unknown is what scares people right. the most, right? And so what happens is you got to rewire that. You don't have to change your home, but maybe it's time to make an addition. Maybe it's time to bring some new emotions in. Because I'm sure you know somebody that's always worried. Yeah. You know, and if they're not worried about themselves or their kids are worried about somebody else's kids or about the earth or something, yeah. right? I'm sure you know. Like the earth or something like so small as that. Like they're like mad about like earth. That's, I feel like that's his way to say like climate change is not real. Or like if it is real, who cares? We'll be dead by the time we have to deal with it. That's that's what I hear when I hear like you, like, oh, caring about the earth and, you know, making sure we have renewable energy in the future. Like that's a problem because you're so obsessed with having problems and it's like all in your head. You should just be happy. Come to my conference, pay $20 million. Okay, cool. That's what I hear. That's the undertones of what I'm gathering here.
You know, somebody's always angry. Yes. They're always pissed off. And if they can't find, if there's not something pissed off in their own life, they get pissed off at something that yep. has nothing to do with them. Yes. Right? And I bet you know somebody who's not funny, but thinks they are, <laughs> you know, and they yes. crack themselves up. Well, you want to hang out with them because yeah. being around them makes you feel yeah. better. So once you know what your emotional home is, now the time to shift it is through these simple practices, asking these three diff decisions differently. Like, what am I going to focus on? What's wrong is always available. Yeah. So it's what's right. Yeah. And you catch yourself and catch yourself. And after a while, yeah. your brain goes there. Now I have a process. All, your, all of your followers, if they want to, can go. There's no cost for it. They can go to TonyRobbins.com forward slash priming. I think you know what priming is. Yep. It's a 10-minute uh, you'll be forever in the Tony Robbins funnel. So if you have any uh, lack of self-control, don't sign up because you are going to be probably most likely pitched thousands of emails for all of Tony's uh, future events, costing upwards of thousands, ten thousand uh, dollars and beyond, I'm sure. So yeah, it's free. Totally no uh, no repercussions from that. And priming is I'll show you an example of what he does. It's priming is like. There you go. That's what it is. I just taught you for free. Now you don't have to be in the sales funnel for Tony Robbins. That's what priming is in his world. The process, yeah. I do it every morning and it's how I've conditioned my mind. I didn't just show up this way. Yeah. And look, I've, you know, I got 105 companies. I got thousands of employees. I got five kids, five grandkids. I'm trying to be a great husband and a great friend and a great brother and an athlete and serve the world. So I understand the challenges of multitasking. If you don't take control of your mind daily for just 10 minutes, you're going to have a rough ride. Right. But if you go through just three minutes of gratitude, like three things you're grateful for, and you don't remember it over there. Like I remember going on a roller coaster. You remember the front of the roller coaster going over, like where you feel it. Yeah. It starts to reprogram because the emotions that mess us up are fear mm. and anger. And gratitude is the solution. You can't be grateful and angry simultaneously. Yep. You can't be grateful and fearful simultaneously. Yes, you can. I'm grateful and angry all the effing time. Should that be a shirt? I'm grateful and angry at the same time. What did he say? Fearful and something at the same time? Yes, you can. It's the solution. You can't be grateful and angry simultaneously. Yep. You can't be grateful and fearful simultaneously. I can't be grateful and fearful. I am also those things right now, currently. I'm fearful of losing everything that I've created, but I'm also grateful that I have it. I, I feel like I've just proven the improvable. Simultaneously. Yeah. So, and then the second part is a part for kind of a blessing, so to speak. People can use a prayer or whatever it is. And then the third part, three minutes, is thinking of three things you want to accomplish, but seeing and feeling them as done and feeling grateful for it so that, as you said, the brain doesn't know the difference between something you actually experience and something that you're imagining. And what happens is at the end of 10 minutes, you're ready for the world and you see the world different. You react to things differently. And so that's just a simple daily practice. So in an event, we do it immersively yeah. and we have people transform and you can see it a year later what it's like, but also you can do this for yourself just daily. And also it's just feeding your mind. Yeah. It's like I grew up around cassette tapes, <laughs> you know, and I used to drive down when I had no money and making 40 bucks a week as a janitor, 35 bucks a week as a janitor. And I would save it up and go buy these tape programs. You couldn't go on YouTube and get stuff for free like that. Camellias in the house. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thanks, Haley. Okay, back to our program. It was like 300 bucks for six cassettes and a workbook. And I tell you that because I valued it. I listened to it again and again and again and again until it became part of me. And... Those investments I made were the best investments of my entire life because it was so expensive for me at that time and it was, I couldn't waste it. And I'm here today, I'm a product of feeding that mind and heart and spirit. Yeah. Right? Um, one of my favorite quotes of yours is, we're focused. Oh God, we know this one. She uses this every freak, freaking day. Uh, I also want to point out that every time Rachel asks a question so far in this part, at least, and she's talked more this time than she did the first half, um, she's basically regurgitating something that he said, like, well, you said this, tell us about that. Like she doesn't ask any follow-up questions related to anything. Cause I don't think she knows what, I mean, I don't know what's going on either to be fair, but I don't think she knows what he's actually saying. So there's no like depth in the questions. It's like, Oh, this is something that, he said, oh, I will look good in front of him, but I've memorized his quotes or whatever. I mean, to be fair, she does use this quote a lot. 
uh, happens to you, life happens to you or for you, not to you, whatever. She uses that one, which apparently is his, and then this one, like where, where energy flow or focus goes, energy flows. Wonderful. She's about to do that, explain it to him, what he said. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, one of my favorite quotes of yours is where focus goes, energy flows. Yes. And I feel like in talking about feeling and what you choose to focus on, it's really powerful. I said it to myself a thousand times when I went through divorce. Yes. Um, will you explain that concept? Well, if you think about it, it kind of comes back to what I said. Whatever you focus on, you feel. Yeah. So if you think you're, you know, you're supposed to meet your husband, your wife, or boyfriend or girlfriend or someone at seven o'clock for dinner and you get there at seven and they're not there, what do you feel? I asked this of an audience, you know, 10,000 people, you get a lot of people saying pissed off and you get a lot of people saying worried. Yeah. And then I go, well, what if it's 730 and they've not called, they've not shown up, and they've not text. I'm really pissed off, really worried. What if it's 830 and they've not called? Somebody will yell out, I'm full. I didn't wait for the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know? But yeah, ultimately what that. you get to see is it's the same. And then the person shows up. Now how do you right. treat them? Right, right. Because right. the so, person who's yeah. upset is saying they don't care. They're out screwing around with somebody else. Yeah. They do this every time. So they're picturing this in their mind, saying these things, puts them in a certain state. Well, when they show up, you're going to treat them in a way that makes them never want to come around you again. Yeah. And then the person who's worried thinks, what if they're in a car accident? And so now they're all stressed out. When they finally arrive there, they're going to greet them very, very differently. So wouldn't you be grateful, like, oh, fearful and grateful at the same time? Scared that they might be in a car accident, but grateful when they show up? We have to train ourselves to focus on what we want instead of what we're afraid of. Mm. And that's just a matter of repetition. I did this with uh, this funny examples with, uh, I had the privilege to be able to learn how to drive race cars. And I got to learn from a guy named Bob Bondurant who owns a school and he's a very famous um, race car driver. And I went to Northern California. There's a place called Laguna Seca that's famous because it has this corkscrew turn where you're going 110, 120 miles an hour straight at a wall and you have to go around it with hyperspeed. And so he puts me in the car the first day and he says, I want to show you what a car can do. And I gets me all belted up. He belts up at the end of that ride, doing all this stuff at the end, my heart was beaten out of my chest. And I'm usually more of an adventure guy, but this thing was not an adventure felt like death. And he looks at me at the end. He goes, in four days, you'll do that. I said, Bob. Jen Murphy. Thank you. Thumbs up hand gesture with the words top. I like it. That's that's what I can see. That's what like it shows up on my screen because it just tells me what it looks like. Um, for that, I will say, unfollow me. But also, get a life. Thank you, Jen Murphy. I appreciate that. Uh, so now we're in the part of the session where Tony Robbins is talking about how he learned to drive a race car, and somehow that's going to be applicable to the everyday person. Can't wait to hear the the. Lesson here. This is so boring. I need like a snoozing uh, sand bite. But I probably, let's just get through this part. It gets better at the end. We're almost near the end where Rachel starts to talk somewhat more about her life and about how bad, you know, I think she talks about Dave at the end, like kind of, you know, not naming him, but like my husband sucks as per usual. So that's the interesting part. We're almost there. You know, I'm real positive and you're crazy. <laughs> I said, I don't even know if I want to do this. He goes, let me help you. And this is a good lesson in life. He said, we're never going to take you at that speed until we first put you in a spin car. I said, what's a spin car? He says, spin car is a special car we've designed. You're going to drive. I don't have any brakes or control. You still have to be in control. But I have these four buttons over here. And I can push one of the four buttons. As soon as I see you're not concentrating enough, I'll push one. And it lifts one of the four wheels up. And we will spin out of control in that direction. And there's walls all around the place. He goes, no, two things. You dot, all you got to remember is focus on where you want to go, not on what you're afraid of. I'm like, I teach this. This is easy. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, right? <laughs> and he says, I guess, I get it. He goes, no, no. He says, I want you to think about it. Have you ever heard about a guy driving his car down a country road, a brand new Porsche going 110 miles an hour, and he hits the only telephone pole in a quarter of a mile? How? Because he goes, I don't want to turn into that. And whatever you focus on, you steer into. Right. So you got to focus where you want. Yes, this is a very relatable story I hear about all the time. Everyone knows that story about the guy driving the Porsche into the telephone line. Yes, the common folk tale from our childhood that we all know and love. I want to go, even though it's scary. 
So I hear him, I understand, I'm gonna go. And then, you know, it's like a challenge for me. I'm not gonna, he's not gonna find me not concentrating. You watch these guys driving cars and it's really intense when you go for a long period of time, more concentration than most sports. I'm sweating, I'm going. And then he finds that moment, just like life. Life doesn't get you when you're prepared, right? right. Your divorce happens when you're not prepared, right? right? You know, that's how life works. You yeah. know, I've been through it too. We've all been through it. So what happens? He pushes the button, we start spinning out of control. What does my brain immediately do? Look straight at the wall. By the way, he just got done telling me, if we hit that at full speed, we can die. He said, and so you got to make sure you break. But secondly, he said, if we hit it and not at full speed and you damage the car, you're paying for the car. So I was like, at all those stuff, I look straight at the wall for all that conditioning, for all that training, I should say. But he saved my life. He pushes my face physically this direction where we got to turn left. Now I'm fighting him because I want to see the death happen. <laughs> 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 but he keeps holding my face. And now what happens? I steer that direction. But here's the thing we all have to remember. You know, when you start doing the right thing, you're not always instantly rewarded because there's a lag time from the momentum you had of the old way. You, you know, right. if you've overeaten for 30 years and then suddenly eat well for two days and you're pissed off, you haven't lost enough weight, you're still in lag time. You got to keep doing the right thing and it'll catch. So sure enough, I'm fighting him like I'm, I'm literally still trying to look at it. He's holding my face. And the last few seconds, the wheels catch. And it's like, you know, my mind is six inches and it was probably five feet, but it didn't matter. My heart's beating out of me, right? He looks at me and goes, did you learn? I said, I learned, I didn't learn to squat. <laughs> you know? So we do it again. I look at the wall and grabs my head. But after four or five times, your nervous system starts to see, this is what I must do to have a great life to survive. Mm -hmm. And so the minute it happens, I turn and just I look. And sure enough, even though it hasn't caught, it catches, it catches. So here's the question for you and your audience. If you do the right thing, if you focus on what you want versus not what you're afraid of, are you guaranteed to succeed? No. no. But if you look at the wall, you're guaranteed to hit it. No. Probably. <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. So the answer is yes. You're supposed to say what I want you to say at all times. Bimbo. That's what he thinks. Not what I'm saying. Uh, geez. Okay. Interesting watch she's oh, got on. There's no guarantee. It's like a very large watch, like a men's watch. Ooh, I wonder if it's her boo thing's watch. Guarantee in life, but when you do the right thing and you direct on what you want versus what you don't want more times than not, you're going to succeed. And that's what we have to train ourselves to do. So that's why I do it in seminars too, because it's one thing to talk about it verbally, as you right. know. It's another thing to change the way your body is using energy while you're doing it for 8, 10, 12 hours a day when you think you wouldn't be able to do two hours because yes. you never have before. Yes. But you know, when you hate what's going on, a minute feels like eternity. But when you're having the time of your life, 12 hours go by is like that. And then three or four days. And what I didn't believe, and I got to see it myself, I didn't believe we could duplicate what we do in a live event. And I'm doing it again, I'm doing yeah. live events. I had 10,000 people here in Palm Beach, but there's very few people you can do, places you can do that. Right. I'm doing an event for right. 25,000 people. And they're in 195 countries. So rad. And you see families together and children. And it's literally like we start here at 10 a.m. For my Australian friends, it's midnight. They go from right. midnight to one in the afternoon. Like yeah. we're in every single time zone around the world. And then you build this community of people who are as driven and hungry as you are. Yeah. It's just gorgeous. And so that's, we figured out how to use COVID, not like COVID, you as us. Right. It's happening for you, right? Yes. COVID's happening for us, guys. That's the best. Hold on. Let's, let's give uh, Rachel the... the, the that what she deserves for that comment. Oh! Trauma solved, everybody. COVID happened for me. We're gonna use COVID instead of letting COVID use us by starting our own uh, multi-million dollar seminar company. Okay, guys, this is the lesson of the day. We're so stupid. We were fearful, but not grateful enough. Duh, duh. It's our fault. Everything's our fault. That's the lesson of the day. Here's my song. Okay, ready? Here's the lesson of the day. Everything is our fault. <laughs> Thank you. That's so rad. That's Rachel's contribution to this podcast. Uh, am I crazy? I thought well, maybe because I'm thinking about the end where she talks. She really doesn't speak very much thus far either. She gave like one small anecdote about how she went to his conference and how she loved it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then that was it so far. Other than saying, yeah, wow, yeah, true. Or answering his question with, with like a leading question, answering his leading question. Ugh, we're almost there, I promise, we're almost there.
not to you. you. <laughs> right. Um, and I do want to say, I think it's an incredible opportunity for people who are at home to be able to go to a virtual conference. Yeah. But I It also would, saves them a ton of money. They don't right, have to fly. They don't have to pay for a hotel. Percent. They don't have to do all those. And they're not away from their family. But yes. I will say for women and moms, it's worth finding a way to do it in person. I love that too. Because of course, this, of course, this is always the follow up. Like, yeah, like it's great. You don't, you can go to the, you can go to the online one. You don't have to find childcare, whatever, but it's worth it to go in person and spend t- three times the amount. You don't go at all. How about that? That's my solution. Don't go at all. You'll probably be better off for it long term. Not even probably, you will be, in my opinion. Because the beauty, obviously, is that you can access it. But I do think, especially in my community, sorry, Mike guy, um, especially in my community. Uh, Where's Jack? Jack wasn't allowed to go with you? Mike guy had to go? Mike the Mike guy? We want Jack to be free. All right. Sorry. Back to back to it. Oftentimes, they're trying. I'm going to go back because this is the first time Rachel's speaking in forever. So I want to, like, give her the floor. Finding a way to do it in person. I love that too, because of the beauty, obviously, is that you can access it. But I do think, especially in my community, sorry, Mike guy, um, especially in my community, uh, oftentimes they're trying to go through a transformative event in the house with yes. the person yes. who is the reason that they're not able to transform. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Um, and and I've seen that in my own community where they'll go yeah. through a day and then their partner is giving them yeah. so much shit or making fun of them, and yeah. they're not really able to. Because you know what a lot of people are doing, though? I've seen a lot of women do it. They go and they do it with a group of girlfriends at their nice. house together. Nice. So it's in a supportive environment. Nice. Some- Kitty Mervine, thank you, thank you. How's it going? It's going. It's going through me, as Savvy Writes Books would say. Uh, life is happening to you and through me for us. But also... Unfollow me. Thank you, Kitty. And welcome back. I know you've been here. Basically, you, you come to all the streams, mostly. I always see you here. And I appreciate your continued allegiance to Kia's world channel. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so funny that Rachel would say this. Uh, you know, oh, like, it's better to go in person and leave the person that is, you know, tra- traumatizing you at home. Didn't she drag and force Dave to go to this event? Like, he didn't want to go, and she's like, if you don't go, if we don't grow, we're dying and our relationship's over. So she forced him to go. So it's like basically the opposite now. It's like, well, now that the divorce is over, now my advice is like, don't don't force your husband to go with you. Go without him and then divorce him. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Some people do it at their office together with yes. other people of that nature. So there's lots of choices. But I I still love doing it in person. It's That's my preference. It's so special. It's just like I was supposed to do one in London coming up and, you know, they shut everything down for Omicron right. and they're opening it back up again. And right. so, so I don't want anybody to be disappointed. And... You, as you've done, you've done more than once. You can do it one time like there and then go live. And it's like, right. that's what people did last year because we only did one live event yeah. in October here yeah. in Palm Beach. Yeah. People flew in from all over the world for it, right? Yeah. Because they'd had other experiences and they wanted to go deeper. Yeah, it's so cool. I think the life-changing thing that I took away the first time I got to sit at one of your conferences was an awareness that I was in control of my own life. Yeah. Which I, which is what you teach, right? I, I loved in your book from the very beginning. It's like I'm not going to support you in your misery. You right. know, it's like these are lies. You are more than you think you are. Right. You can make these things happen, but you got to take 100 percent responsibility to make right. that happen. I love right. that about you. Well, what's I think, and that's proof right there that Tony is very good at what he does. I don't think he read her book at all. I don't think he knows who Rachel Hollis is. I think he knows he gets a sheet probably beforehand. His assistant is say, giving him a one sheet which shows like who her target audience is, what her, the basics of the book that she wrote is, you know, why she was selected to be here for the interview. And he memorizes that and then does the interview. So I will say for that, he is impressive. And I think, you know, he makes it, you feel like he knows sort of like what her deal is. Uh, I don't think he's read her book. I cannot imagine that he would find it interesting in any way. Um, but he got the basics of it because someone else that he is on his payroll most likely had to read it. So he doesn't look stupid, uh, during an interview. And again, here we have Rachel kissing his ass, basically. It's incredible about this book. What's incredible about money, like 
you, you're, you keep trying to give this to people. And now it's an ownership of our health. Yes. On every level. Yes. Um, it's pretty wild to think about the legacy that you have created and continue to create. And I'm curious what still drives that, like, Money. It's called money. There's money to be made that will continue to drive most people until there is no money to be made anymore. There's obviously people still interested in Tony Robbins content. They still want to go to his events. There's money in the bank. There's money coming through the door. He ain't going to stop until that money dries up and it ain't drying up anytime soon. Okay. Your life's incredible. You've already, you know, I was, I was explaining to my kids who I was coming to, to meet. I was like, he, He's he did this like I'm doing this work because you yes. came before me oh, and beautiful. you continue. Yeah, you, yeah you continue to pour your life force, pun intended, out to, yeah. to give people the ownership in all these different areas of their life. Um, Does anyone else think of life force as like, you know, you know, do you ever do you think that, too? Do you hear like the sexual undertone life force? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. What is, what's driving that still? It's always been impact for me. I love people. I'm a, you know, somebody asked my mom, was he always like this? She's passed away, but she used to tell the story. So I'd hear her version of the story. And, you know, we grew up in kind of the hood of LA, a really rough ter- territory and on a commercial street. And this crappy little house was a lot of violence around there. But right next door was this old liquor store. And we were poor and she was pregnant with my brother. I was almost four and a half, I guess, years old, five years old. And, you know, I would go to that place to get stuff because we had nobody else. My father was an underground parking attendant, so he wasn't there. So it was she and I. And so I guess she sent me next door to get bread and milk, which we desperately needed. We had very little money. I guess I was gone for a very long time where she was worried. And I come back with no bread and milk. And she, she said, where's the bread and milk? And I said, well, there's a poor boy there. So I gave him our money. And she says, we're poor. <laughs> you know? So I've always had that. And I think there's an old movie called Mr. Holland's Opus. I use it sometimes to date with Destiny. And there's a line in the movie with this man his whole life was about, you know, writing this great opus and how he'd make him rich and famous and all these things. And he becomes a school teacher, not because he likes kids, but because he gets off at 3 p.m. and has the summers off, thinks he's going to write this opus. And I almost, I, I, I could cry thinking about it right now because it's just what life's about. You know, life's about love, life's about people. But there's this moment when he loses his job because they cut the music program and he decides he's going to retire. And he's leaving with his wife and his kid, who's deaf. He's oh, ironic. I know. Musician. You know the movie. I am very familiar. Uh, not, with I get to think about right now. Every time I watch it, you know, I, you see this man come, and he's at the latter years of his life, and all of a sudden, as he's leaving, there's this sound in the gym, and they, he goes, "What is that sound?" He goes, "No." And it's after hours. He goes to open up the gym, and there's all these students from all the years of his 25 years of teaching or 30 years of teaching, whatever it was. And they're all cheering, and he comes down, and, and he's just stunned by the response. And his wife gets up and says, you know, a lot of people heard about you know, the retirement of, of my husband, and I can't believe the outreach. And so we wanted to let him know how much he's loved. And, and then all of a sudden, the doors open, and this little redhead girl who he had blasted in the beginning because she had no talent in the clarinet, yeah. um, but he then fell in love with trying to support her, and it's when he became a better man. She's now an adult and she's the governor right. of the state. And she goes bursting in and goes, oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were a little bit running late. And she comes up and she looks at him and gets on stage and she does this little speech. But the essence of it is, um, Mr. Holland's touched all of us so much. <laughs> she says, uh, um, you know, Mr. Holland had this opus he was going to write. He, and word was it was going to make him rich and famous. But he's neither. At least not outside this small town. But she said, but if he just got those riches and fame, he would have missed out on what he has here. And she says, look around you, Mr. Holland. These are the notes of your music. This is the symphony of your life. And um, sorry, again, emotionally, I'm so silly. <laughs> Emotional guy. That's why I do what I do, because I get to see um, people's lives change. I get to see moms reclaim themselves. I see children, you know, stand up for themselves. I see men who become men again and really step up and take the responsibilities that make them feel alive. I see people build businesses and I see people happy again. I see couples coming together. 
I see joy and happiness, not because life is always like that, but because they can find meaning even when it's painful. And to me, to live a life with that kind of meaning is a gift from God. But if Tony Robbins was like a social studies teacher or a guy who worked in like a nonprofit space trying to, you know, get men and women to feel better about themselves, I could be like, yeah, this is a relatable story. That's great. You know, and Rachel was just interviewing him because he wrote a book and then it took off or something. But aren't you the guy who did write the opus and become rich and famous? And you scaled the business so much you can bear like the only people you can see one on one are like celebrities or people who can afford hundred thousands of dollars per hour of coaching. So I don't understand, and I you know I don't I think I've seen Mr. Holland's opus before. I don't remember it fully, but I don't think it's as relatable as it, he's making it seem to his life. I think he's the guy who made it. So wouldn't that be what that guy Mr. Holland wanted? Tony is the realized dream, not the not the guy who actually changed lives because he could never get out of the small town or whatever. I don't know. I don't know the movie well enough to make the connection, but that's what he cries about. And in this um, video, Rachel and the and the uh, subtitle or subtitle, the thumbnail says, "I made Tony Robbins cry." No, you didn't. He's recounting a, a like a beloved movie <laughs> that I guess had a moment of sadness. I don't think Rachel caused him to cry. He is gonna cry. He's crying about how like you know lucky he is to to be able to touch lives or whatever, um, which is fine. I'm all about men crying, you know, within reason. Anyone crying, anyone, not just men, anyone crying within reason. Um, so I don't think that's the. I'm not against that or having him have a moment, but I just. He ties it back into like why you should go to his seminar. So it loses a little bit of the, the authenticity for me. Like, oh, you know, I see women and men and every par po possible, excuse me, every possible customer that he may or may not have uh, in his demographic. You know, he's making sure to, to hit those uh, demos so that, oh, okay, if you want to go to a conference, like this is what I'm going to provide for you. It's like, eh, kind of loses it for me. Anyways, let's see Rachel's response. She's now, because he's cried, she's got to one-up him and cry, too, about her own success. So, get ready. And I think I was um, made to do this, and I've done my part, but I've also been graced. And that's why, I like, I'm so obsessed. Like, you know, this book, like, I want somebody not to have the fear of cancer I had. And now I can help them because there's a brand new blood test. You know, 80% of the people who get stage 2, stage 3 cancer is an example. And the Cancer Society says they're going to die. Now, 20% live. I've, I focus on that. But they're right. When you get that long, it's really tough to turn around. But if you get it stage one or two, it's 80 to 99% success. And a doctor, all these people in this book, these heroes, they tell their stories. They'll make you cry. They'll make you laugh. The doctor who created that lost his wife. Almost everyone here who created these breakthroughs that are life-changing, that sound unbelievable, they did it because it wasn't about them. They lost someone they loved. They lost their wife. They lost their husband or one of their children or something of that nature. And I guess I identify with them is like they just found a way to go beyond what people thought was possible. So now you can do this test. It's a simple blood test. It tells you whether you have 50 cancers or not. We had a man come in. His wife pushed him. He's like, I already did a physical. I did, you know, they did my blood and your analysis. We did this test. It's called a grail test. Designed by this man who lost his wife because they discovered too late. And we find out he has kidney cancer. But it's just the beginning. It's a 20-minute outpatient procedure. He's perfectly fine. Starry nights. Thank you for that 99 cents. Hey, for that, I say. Unfollow me. And. Get a life. But also, I'm going to need uh, 19. No, I'm going to need $17. Oh, God. Uh, 17 dollars and one cent more to get um the full experience of 18 stinking dollars but thank you very much i appreciate your contribution um this is a good place to take a break too for a stop for a second because uh now we've quickly jumped into uh more cancer talk related to, excuse me there's a bug on this mic um related to the book and how he's he's going off now on a tangent it's like i wish they would have just stopped for a moment and had the moment and i could be on board with like okay that was a nice moment out of this two hour thing that i really got nothing out of that was a nice 
segment. Um, as much as I think it could be, it's probably manipulative and all those things. But I can, you know, I have a heart as well. I can, you know, see, all right, something was there. But now it's back into, oh, I just, all these people in my book talk about the cancer, the blah, blah, blah. And like a lot of people that he features in the book, from what I understand, are people who are, you know, more on the fringes of medical science. They have degrees, they went to Harvard, whatever, but they're also business owners and they're trying to do my medical biohacking and like, you know, genetic testing, but with like not through a university somewhere, like they're going to do it the capitalistic way, which means that you have to be on board to be interested and you have to, you know, buy into it on the side. You're not going to be done at a hospital or whatever. So it's really for rich people. That's what I, my understanding is. A lot of these things that he's talking about are like for the rich um, treatments that you can't get just at, you know, going to the doctor. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I digress. I guess let's just go back and watch it because I'm just disappointed that he's using this emotional moment to sell immediately with no breath in between. And he's a father, he's a husband. I mean, his wife is so relieved. And it was that easy because the tools are here now. You know, there's a, there's a test called a CCTA test. I, I'll, I'll finish with this, I know we gotta go, but um, my, when I have this group called Fountain Life, a group of doctors, and I have a partner named Dr. Bill Cap. Beautiful man, he built 12 hospitals, ran them, and then after 20 years said, I am so sick of, of you know, reaction care. I'm so sick of disease care. I wanna do precision, I wanna do regeneration. I wanna prevent, I wanna show people it's possible. So we built these centers across the US and we're doing one in Abu Dhabi. And he calls me the day, he's one of those super understated guys. You know, he's one of those guys you gotta lean forward and listen to. He doesn't, doesn't talk loud like me, he doesn't overstate it. And he's just like, boom. And he goes, Tony, um, I'm calling because there's been a breakthrough in cardiology that I think since- oh, Okay, um, this, let me go back a second. This, this is uh, how to tell someone you got a phone call when you actually didn't get a phone call. Does that make sense? He's about to say like, oh, this guy called, why would this guy call Tony Robbins to tell any of this information to him? Let me know. I just went back a little bit so you can hear, like this is 100% fake in my opinion. Cloud like me, he doesn't overstate it. And he's just like, boom. And he goes, Tony, um, I'm calling because there's been a breakthrough in cardiology that I think sincerely is one of the greatest breakthroughs in the last decade. And he said, you've got to take advantage of it. And we're the first ones exposed to it. I want you to come check it out. So what is it? He said, well, why would they call him? There's a breakthrough in cardiology. Does he have a cardio problem that we don't know about? Or why would they, why would they want him to be the first person to come see it? You know, the number one killer of men and women is heart disease, heart attack. And he said, you know, the only way we see what's going on usually is someone does a CT scan and that's usually when there's a real problem and they're hard to read because what they're looking for is, you know, have you built up, you know, the things in your veins that are going to knock you down that. But what's interesting is the soft tissue is very different than when it calcifies. Mm -hmm. And the traditional mm -hmm. scan can't tell you that. You might have a really high number, but it might all be calcified, which means it's healed, right? It's the stuff that's fleshy that can break off and make you a widow maker yeah. by giving you a heart attack or, or um, you know, a brain aneurysm. And so I said, well, this is fascinating. How does it work? He goes, it has an AI and it literally opens digitally. This is the world we're in now. Opens your veins digitally, searches through and finds out, is there soft plaque? That's what will kill you or could kill you. Or is it hardened? And gives you a score, tells you where it is. They can predict a heart attack five years in advance and they tell you what to do to avoid it. So this is like what I live for. So I was like, Okay, I'm just gonna let it go. I don't even know what to say. Okay, I'm coming. But my father-in-law's with us and he's just turning 80. Beautiful man, I love dearly, like he's my own father. And he built a business from nothing. He's a self-made man and the lumber business. But you know, when you get to 80, people around you in our culture are like, oh, you gotta prepare, you know, right. life's ending. And, and I watched the last few years while well, that energy started to drop because everybody around him talks that way. Get your affairs in order. Right. And you know, he was worried. He says that as, as if that's a stupid idea. Oh, they tell, when you're 80, you should get your affairs in order. All oh, the doctors say that you should get your affairs in order. Pfft, they don't know anything. It's like, so is that bad advice? I think that's probably good advice. And if you live to 100, great, but you still have your affairs in order no matter what. These doctors don't know what they're doing. These lawyers just want to tell you to get your affairs. They just want to tell you to go to the doctor. Stupid. It's like, okay. Thanks, Tony. What's the alternative? I'm sure it's going to be some sort of million dollar surgery.
Edward Orville might have a heart attack because you know, his father did and so forth. And guess what? I said, Dad, why don't you come with me? We'll do this little test. It's brief. It's fantastic. We probably both have some soft plaques, and, but they'll tell us where it is, and they'll show us what to do to clear it up. He decides to come with me. We go there, Rachel. This is, like, this is what I live for. We go there, and my father-in-law is completely clean. Everything is calcified. He has no problems in his heart at all. He's got a like, heart like a 25-year-old, <laughs> right? I'm doing much better than I was from five years ago. I'm doing great, but he's doing even better than I am. I mean, literally nothing to worry about. I live for those moments where you see that light in his eyes where it's like, oh, my God, I have a life. And then, you know, there, we have this technique that uh, works with a lot of athletes and anybody. Whenever you injure yourself, soft tissue gets around and then the fluid doesn't get in, oxygenation get in, and often nerves get trapped. What? So I had this trap thing in my ankle without wasting all the time to tell a Dory story. It's just so bad that for 16 years, if you even touched it there, it's like I was electrocuted. Don't touch me. I did, it, I did 50. He has a thing on his ankle that if you touch him, it feels like he's been electrocuted. Go to a doctor, Tony. Fly to your Swedish doctor. My God, that's probably not normal. <laughs> Yikes. 15 minute procedure with this two years ago. You can kick me, you can do anything I don't feel anything, it's perfect. They just open it up with this fluid, amnio fluid, same thing we're born in, and then the nerve packed back in place. So I said, what makes dad feel old? Afraid he's gonna have a heart attack, right? or stroke, both of those aren't gonna happen. And now, like, I'm in pain all the time and I can't walk. Huh? So I said, Dad, as long as you're here, you can do this little relief thing, why don't you have them look at your hip? End of 30 minutes, they find two locations, they treat it literally right there. He walks out an hour later, perfectly smooth for the first time in a decade, right? So we get on the, this is all finished with you, get on the plane, he looks at me like this and he goes, you know, Tone? Tone. He was too healthy to finish his name. Tone. He goes, those guys that talk about living to 110, 120, I don't know if I buy that. But my heart's perfect. I'm walking perfect. I gotta live another 20 years. I can live to 100. You've only been married to my daughter 22 years. That's like a whole new <laughs> life. So I live for that. That's why I wrote this book. Huh? <laughs> uh, besides feeding 20 million people and, and advancing the research, I want people to have answers for those. Besides feeding 20 million people, he gives money to Feeding America. I'm glad he does. I think he should continue doing that. I think it's a wonderful thing. We heard about it 15 times. Thank you. We got it. You feed millions of people a year. Got it. Thank you. They love. I get a call once every 10 to two weeks and this divided country of ours, we're all divided by all kinds of things. But one thing I think we're unified by, none of us want to lose our family members or friends and we're going to, but wouldn't it be nice to prevent it? Wouldn't it be nice to heal it? Wouldn't it be nice to have somebody you love about feel 10 years younger or yourself? Wouldn't it be nice to have the energy for you along with your kids and everyone else? Yeah, it would be nice, Tony. Guess what type of people get to have those luxuries in life? People with money. People with health insurance. Not everyone's so lucky to have those things, bro. So what are we supposed to do if we can't afford it? Just die and be grateful? Is that the advice? And so those answers are actually here right now. And I'm dedicated to getting it out. And I'm excited to hear the stories of yeah. what's going to happen. I've already had a few because before the book went out, we sent it people. I've got an assistant whose father was going in for back surgery. And he read the pain chapter. He didn't go in. He's out of pain right now. I've put him up with a guy named Peter Goscu. Okay, that anecdote is concerning. Guy had pain in his back, had scheduled for surgery, read the pain chapter, didn't go in. Now he's healed. What did he do? Just read the pain chapter. That's enough that heals your pain. Lord. That has this technique that I've used for 25 years. It's like, that's what I live for. And that's what gives me energy. And that's what keeps me going. Yeah. Sorry about the tears. No, <laughs> no. I want to, I want to make sure and say, cause we're talking about stories um, before we end this. Five years ago, now I'm going to cry. Cool. <laughs> okay, well, that's fair. <laughs> um, five years ago, I went to UPW conference. Um, and it utterly changed my life. And the work that I've done, like I sat in that, I sat in that arena and asked bigger questions. And for most of my adult life, I had, um, I thought something was wrong with me because I thought, I have, I'm a mom and I'm a wife and I'm not supposed to have ambition and I'm not supposed to dream of something bigger. And it was the first time in my life that I thought maybe God made me this way on purpose. Mm. And so I was like, well, if God made me this way, what would I do differently? Mm. 
Mm. And girl, wash your face is a result of sitting in that conference. Wow. Throwing my first conference is a result of sitting in that conference. And I know you won't always get to meet the effect of your work, but you affected me. And oh. then I affected other women. And does she mean infected? <laughs> I'm sorry. I know she's having a moment, but he seems like he's got some real tears or he had some. Hers seem a little less. She's more in control of her tears. She's held them back, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, again, this is just her praising him for being such an inspirational person. What happened? Like, but like she could have met him multiple times and he wasn't interested. He's only interested if it's there's something in it for him. So it seems um, in their interaction. So it's like, I guess that's in the past. Forget about it, whatever. But another thing that she said is like, oh, you know, God made me this way and have ambition. But then she also tells the story about her parents only caring about her when she was achieving something. And I think that seems much more logical and truthful that her parents, you know, she was the, the youngest of four kids, I believe. And she felt neglected because she was the last one to grow up and her brother had issues and all that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense as to why you would try to achieve, 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 be an overachiever to get that attention. I think that's more of a defense mechanism than a, oh, God may be this way. So now I'm going to go and like, you know, start a company. And I think people who go to these types of conferences, they're searching for something. They're searching for either confirmation of something they already feel um, or they're looking for an answer as to why they're having issues in their life. And this guy is going to tell you like, oh, having ambition, this is your God given right to have this ambition. And meanwhile, if, if she was to go to therapy, they would probably say like, look, you don't have to try so hard. You're already good the way you are. You're not made for more. You're made enough period. But that doesn't sell conferences. That mentality does not sell books because if you're not searching for more, there's nothing to consume. There's nothing more to buy if you're already confident, comfortable. So I feel like a lot of these gurus, they'll tell their story about, oh, I was an alcoholic, I was this, and then I overcame it by just working harder and being better. It's like, yeah, you probably still need to work on it. You probably need to come to a conclusion where if you were you know, completely absolved or gone from the internet, gone from the, the spotlight, that you would be okay with yourself. And I think a lot of these people would not be. That's my rant, that's my, uh, my Sunday preaching. And back to the video. I love you're never that. gonna <laughs> see the full, you're never gonna see the full results of what you've done. And it's not that thing where it's like, oh, you changed my life, because I worked my ass off, I, I changed my life. I understand that, I agree. But I, if I hadn't had that catalyst, if I hadn't sat in that or jumped in that arena with you and peed my pants over and over because I pushed babies out of this body, like if I hadn't had... Can we stop with the peeing because you had babies? I'm so sick of hearing that. Like again, about the women thing. If women want to be treated seriously, why do we tell these stories about, I peed myself, I peed myself. It's like, is that what men talk about? Maybe it is, but how about you keep it professional? I think that's the key. I don't know. I just feel awkward. I'm like, okay, why are you telling me this in a professional setting? But you peed yourself because you had babies. Like, obviously. Okay, how does this relate to anything? I had that experience. <laughs> I wouldn't be who I am today. Well, you're giving me more credit than I deserve. No, But it's, I love it's that I've been able to be a part of your journey yeah. and been a helpful part of your journey. And I love even more that you've taken the things you've figured out for you and passed them on because that's why we're all here. Yeah. In the end, you know, life is about meaning. Yeah. And the most meaningful thing is to grow and to give. Yeah. And you've done both those. So thank, thank you for that. You. This is a this is a literal um, dream come true. Well, thank, so thank you. Well, no you one else got me to cry. I don't know how you pulled that off, kid, but you did. I'm trying to be the next <laughs> Oprah, man. I got to figure it out somehow. Okay. One, I don't like that he called her kid. I had a guy one time at a job call me. We were the same age. He called me, hey, kid. Well, that's how it goes, kid. And I was like, excuse me. And I'm not very confrontational, especially at this time. But I was like, please don't ever call me that again. Please don't ever. Like, you're diminishing my professionalism in this environment. I am the same age as you. I am in the same position as you. Do not call me kid. And even in this dynamic, they are two adults interviewing each other in a space where she's got a platform, he's got a promotion, something to promote. Why is he calling her kid? Yes, she's younger, but the 
to me, it feels wrong. It diminishes her credibility and authority to be there in that space. And it's very on brand to what she said he was like before, where he did not feel like he owed her anything. Not a hello, how are you, not nothing, when she opened up for his conference, allegedly. So don't like that. And then her saying like, oh, I'm trying to be the next Oprah. Have you not given that up by now, Rachel? The next Oprah? Even Oprah wasn't on board with you becoming an Oprah. I think you need to hit reality a little bit and be like, look, I had my shot. It didn't work. You're going to have to go away for a while, maybe rebrand and try again. But the way you're doing it now ain't going to be, you're not going to be Oprah. Oprah had, you know, I guess, I don't know if Oprah had scandals back in the day, but mm, I don't think it's happening. Oprah asked some tough questions to people. Rachel does not. She picks and chooses her friends to interview. You know, what is she really? She's not a reporter like Dave Hollis believes he is. It's just like, I ain't think, maybe, who knows? Everyone has a chance. Follow your dreams. Live your, live your best life, whatever. But I just don't foresee it happening. All right. She left this part because basically they could have ended the interview right there. That was the end. They hugged. They said, okay, good job, kid. And then she left it rolling. So this is her putting this in here for a reason. And this is the part where she opens up a little bit more about her own, like, personal stuff. Okay. <laughs> That's beautiful, you that. Thank you. <laughs> um, not for whatever, but I will say, um, you know, when you uh, you have to give your personality a name. Yeah. So the name that I chose at that UBW was Mogul. Oh, wow, And it was cool. the first tattoo that I oh, ever got. Oh, that is so yeah, cool. Yeah, it's still there. So that's Mary cool. has a, uh, is your aunt? Cousin. Cousin, who went to UBW just recently, and she unfortunately lost her husband. He committed suicide. Mm. I said, please bring him. And of course, you know, I knew she was there, and I'm working on people. I hear what's going on with people, and I do. I don't know what he meant there. It was kind of like a Freudian slip where he's like, oh, your aunt came to UPW, and her husband, unfortunately, committed suicide and I, I told him I told her to bring him it's like what wait go back but I don't know maybe he had a slip of the tongue I don't know what the heck he meant by that things worked on her but she's so transformed and so beautiful but the funny part was she said she came to the house and I took a picture with her and she goes can I have an autograph and Mary's so protective of me even though it's her family I was like honey you don't really protect me I, I, I want to visit with her and she goes would you sign sign a piece of paper for me I said sure and what do you want that for she, she, it was that big. She's tattooing my signature <laughs> on her arm. <laughs> Two weeks before, never heard of me. I was like, oh, want a tattoo? I was like, I don't know. Maybe you should think of something else you want to tattoo yeah. besides my signature. In the end, what happened? The guy couldn't duplicate my signature. What did he do? He put... Live with passion. Okay. Live with passion. <laughs> it's got end. like a trademark <laughs> symbol. <laughs> That's really cool. That's cool. That's gorgeous. Yeah. I am so grateful to finally yeah, yeah. get to know who you are. This lady, I have to thank because she was the bridge for us. Yeah. Um, because she was such a fan of yours. And then she showed me your book. And I was like, wow, I love the way you attack this with these lies, these false beliefs that yeah. limit us. And I loved how you called women to be more and not to just accept. Because, as you know, in the feminine world, very often, yes. they're so supportive of each other that you don't grow. Right. This part is what I'm talking about. Okay, in the feminine world, what the fuck is that? What is the feminine world? Is it like a Hogwarts? Like you have to go through Diagon Alley to get to the feminine world where everyone's uh, supportive of each other? Literally, okay, also I know I'm the, but also uh, I know I haven't played it on this channel, but the Skinny Confidential podcast, which we will again talk about tomorrow, um, she says like, Women are so mean to each other on Facebook. They just tear each other down. Women just hate women. Other women made my life horrible because, you know, they were mean that I, they mom shamed me and blah, blah, blah. And they're so unsupportive of each other. And now he's saying, well, you know, women, they just are too supportive that they don't grow. And she's like, yeah, yes, yes, queen. That's what we do. We support too much, too much support. It's like, Again, they cannot keep their story straight. And again, let's talk, I'm gonna go back just a couple seconds to talk about feminine world. <sighs> yeah. That limit us. And I loved how you called women to be more and not to just accept, because as you know, in the feminine world, very often, yes. they're so supportive of each other that you don't grow. Right. And it's hard, and, and no man can say that shit right. to them, right? Right. But you could. Yeah. And you've lived it. Yeah. And it's there. And I, I say this too, and this. She was not supportive of Pam. 
she hates Pam because she can't stick to a diet. I mean, yeah, I guess that's what her message was. Like, if you support someone who's going through a hard time, like, you're actually hurting them, I suppose. But is that a good message? And uh, now, I uh, know, thank you. It's not a dig in any way, but I was sitting at that conference and I was so inspired and I was so like pumped. And I just kept thinking, why are there no women on this stage? Yes. And I and thought now, that, by the way, well, I thought that for three days and then I just heard this, like, it was the strongest moment I've ever had. Maybe I'm supposed to be on the stage. <laughs> I like that. That's Swear to so God. Cool. And I planned my first conference and I went $40,000 into debt because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And a hundred people came. <laughs> oh my God. And then I had slow- seven for my first right. one thinking there's 500. So I, so I just understand. slowly kept, yeah, kept building and growing and it's, Okay, what a moment. I told you it would get juicy at the end. I do not lie uh, often. I lie. Okay, it's not true. I don't lie to you that much that I know of. Um, okay, so a lot to, to uh, go through. I won't say unpack because that's so 2017. Uh, a lot to go through in those final moments. Um, so I don't think in this moment that Tony knows that she's been on his stage before. I think he has a team that does the hiring for who's on stage and whatever, which would explain why he didn't introduce himself to her and really have any sort of like, hey, I'm so sorry, I never got to see you, whatever. Um, that's my thought, that he has no clue that she's been on the stage before. Uh, secondly, the fact that she's like, oh, there's no women on this stage and not thinking, maybe this is a problem. Maybe this guy who's doing this conference doesn't think women deserve to be on stage because we're you know, lesser than. The feminine world is different than the world I'm here, I, I, yet I'm paying this guy my money. Maybe I should get the heck out and go to somewhere else that has a, a more you know, equal balanced programming. But no, instead she thinks, well, I should be on the stage. I should take this. I, I can fix them. That's, that's a, I can fix them mentality. Instead of going, you know, this guy is smart enough to sell out these conferences. He should be smart enough to know that diversity is important. Gender wise, racially, ethnically, religiously, whatever, in all facets of the world, it makes sense to have a variety of voices on a stage, especially when you're talking about life's biggest questions and truths. Okay. Instead of taking that critical thinking skill and going, this is not someone I want to support until they change, or if they never, you know, if they ever do change, instead she's like, you know, I'll be the first. I'll be the first. I'll change him. I'll make him better. I will step up to the plate. It's like, is that the lesson? I mean, that's a narcissistic lesson. <laughs> but it's like, and he's like, oh, but they do now. We do now. It's like, yeah, well, she was on it. So I don't think he's aware. Once again, I think he has no idea that she's spoken for him before. It's been. Well, I'm it's glad been you persisted. Tip. And I know we all go through different seasons. Yeah. And I know you've been through a winter recently. Hell yeah. And I'm sure you've got some winter feelings yeah. still, especially with all that's going on in the world yeah. on top of it, honey. But Honey, on top of it, honey. Red flag number two. Uh, kiddo and honey are two terms I do not want to be referred to in a professional setting with someone who I would want to consider an equal. Yes, Tony has more money. Yes, Tony is more successful. But Rachel worked her ass off. She did. As much as she will tell you, like, that she worked hard, whatever, and you could, you know, say, well, she did or she didn't. But she has climbed up. She has, like, insulted people along the way to get to this level. Show her some respect. But the fact that he's not doesn't seem to be a red flag to her at all. And that's the concerning part. Who you are is more than anything that's ever happened to you. Yeah. And what you've already given would be a life well lived, but you have, you're very young and there's so much more to give. And right. going through those winters is where most of my greatest strengths and most of my greatest insights have come from. Because if I could solve it for me, I could solve it for both of us, for hundreds of thousands or millions right. of other people. Right. So when you're in the middle of that, it, it, I don't know if it's helpful or not. For me, what's really helpful is go, I'm not the only one going through this shit. <laughs> whatever it is, financial, business, relationship, kids. And it's like, okay, if I can figure this out, then I can help so many other people. And they give me a different incentive than just me. And then I don't feel bad about having the problem or the challenge. And so I, I hope that's a seed I can plant yeah. in you. Because, you know, and what also follows winter, as you well know, yeah. thank God is spring, yeah. right? You know? I think um, the, what I'm... Guys, he's going to plant a seed in her, in her life force. <laughs> okay, here's, here's Rachel's... Uh, uh, this is the most she's talked the whole time. She's let two hours go by. Now she's having her moment, okay? This is her moment. 
trying to grapple with now is there was sort of this meteoric rise after a lifetime of sure. working at something. Sure. You know? And with that the rise, it felt like then sort of a target. Um, yeah. Cause it's, I don't think people are used to seeing a woman on stage with energy and sort yeah. of challenging you. And um, I, there's a part of me, sorry, this became a small therapy session. But what do you mean? People aren't used to it. At Tony Robbins conference. Yeah. Cause he seems to be misogynistic and calls you honey. These are all signs that you should be picking up on at this point. People are very used to Oprah has been around since the fucking eighties. She's had her own show. Like there's been women on stages for many, many years, Rachel. It's only in these small sects of, of groups that they don't see that women have value. You're not the first one to have these thoughts. Oh, well, I, you know, I've never seen a woman on stage. Yeah, maybe you're in the wrong stages. Maybe you're in the wrong places, in the wrong auditoriums. That's a little bit on you because they, they do exist. They're out there all over the place. Thank you, JLB Nerdy. Super chat for a song. Okay, here's a lesson. Rachel's in the wrong place. She needs to go somewhere outside of the masculine world to the world where we all exist. Good? Is that satisfactory? Uh, if not... Unfollow me. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to Rachel. Sorry. There's a part of me that is sort of like, fuck am I putting myself through this? Like yeah. why, you know, there, I, I could write books. I could do, I don't have to be so forward facing. Yes. Um, but and yet I, there's a part of your personality that demands that. Right. Cause you respond to challenge. You right. grow. You're, right. you're very unique and structured that way. And God made you that way. So you should take advantage of it as right. much as you can. Right. And you can give yourself balance too. Right. Cause we live in a crazy world right now where everybody yeah. monitors every word you say right. and they misinterpret it and they go right. crazy with it. This is not forever. This right. is part of the winter. Yeah. Right. But it'll change and people, people are going to get sick of it. Just like they're sick of COVID. They're going to yeah. get sick of all this backbiting right. bullshit. Right. And it'll turn yeah. and you do well during this time when like continue to grow. And you'll be set for the rest of your life because spring will come and spring is a different attitude. It's like winter doesn't mean there aren't good days. It just means it's mostly cloudy and, right. and, and more than not, right? right? Yeah. And then springtime comes and it's mostly sunny and easy. And so, uh, and holding you now, may I ask? 39. So, so, honey, you're, first of all, you're coming near 44. Honey, you are young, princess. Princess Peach, baby cakes. I saw someone said sweet cheeks. Sweet cheeks, you're young. You are young doe. That is just out here with the big boys, just just making papas proud all over the world. Shut up, God. But she's a, uh, and not to victim blame because I feel like Rachel in this situation is is the victim of someone who not treating her with respect that she deserves. Um, regardless of my feelings for Rachel, everyone deserves respect and Tony too. But in a position where he's the higher, more successful person, she's there in his home. She's not getting the respect that she deserves, <laughs> and. This needs to be as a strong, independent woman teaching other women. You need to stand up for yourself in this situation. It's not easy. This guy could be your idol, whatever. I would be so impressed and, and learn so much more if she was to say, look, bro, dude, uh, cut it. Stop saying this stuff to me. I am just as much allowed to be here as you are. <sighs> okay. 40 alone, I used to remember everybody telling me, Oh, you turned 40, all these, they're all so full of shit. And then I got 40 and I was totally depressed and I never feel depressed because I just got a divorce, yeah. right? Which I initiated, right. but I got a divorce and my kids weren't with me. And I was like, is blood thicker than water? Cause you know, three of my kids are adopted. And I mean, I was the worst day 40 and I look back on it and then 50 was better, but I was still like, but, you know, even at 40, it's like, have I done enough? I don't help millions of people. You've done this too. And then, you know, 60, I'm telling you, so you don't have to wait that long. <laughs> Sunday, finally around 60, my brain was like, shit, I've done more than enough. I'm still going to do 10 times more. Right. But it was no more like, have I done enough? Have I created enough? Have I given enough? Have I done those enough? Mm. There's no more questioning of that process. So it's a natural process to go through a stage of life where you're certain and crushing it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a period of questioning. Right. The questioning could be the environment that triggers the questioning. It could be a relationship that triggers the questioning. It could be things going on with your kids. But that period of questioning, I'm making up, let's say seven years of target going for it. And then you've got this six months or a year, or a year and a half of questioning. And then one of two things happens. You either go, this is the greatest shit in the world that I'm doing and you recommit to it. 
Or you pick another direction and go there. And right. then you'll go for, I'm making up the years, seven years, and you'll question again. Having lived a few more decades, I'm just telling you, this is a natural process. And right. it's actually healthy. Mm. Because once you recommit, once you've said no, like what you just said there, if you decide, yeah. I don't need to do this, then don't do it. Do something else and enjoy yourself. Or I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it these ways selectively. So I have more time to do this that I enjoy. And I, but I'm still going to keep growing this area. Yeah. But whatever you do, we either commit to what you've already done or you commit to something new. It'll reinvigorate you again right. for another period of time. Yeah. And then you'll question again. <laughs> Did you always have a thick skin about? No. No. I Some still don't have get... that. Okay, here comes the, uh, so that whole thing, whatever. I don't think what he said is bad advice necessarily. I thought that was probably the best advice I had heard in this whole thing and something I can understand. Like, oh, do you, like, as a successful person, do you always question you know, if I'm doing the right thing. And he's like, yeah, I always question it. And then you decide to either keep doing what you're doing or do something else. Okay, that's actually something I could take away from this conversation and go, yeah, I could apply that to my life, thank you. But this is them off, off camera. This is like, he, I don't think he even thinks that they're being recorded anymore. I think they hugged and it was like, thank you for being here. And I think that they assumed like, this is just like off camera, but she's, you know, she spoke in this part. So she's like, okay, let's put this on the YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, and also, what the heck was he talking about with the adopt my adopted kids? I have adopted kids. Is blood thicker than water? What the frick? What are you saying? <laughs> I want. I need some uh, follow up on that question. Are you saying that adopted kids are not as uh, good to you or not as useful to you or what? I don't understand what that comment was about. Kind of made on the fly. Uh, now, she, now she's going to talk about the thick skin that she requires to be in this space as a woman and asking him if he's always had thick skin because the haters out there are just trying to ruin their day and not take all their advice and shove it down our throats like they would like. Thick oh. skin, just see me just crying here? What the hell, what the hell are you thinking, right? Well, I look I mean, like I got a thick skin. I feel like getting so much shit in, in personal development, there's so much yeah. that's not based on any actual fact, Yeah. but there's so much shit. And I... I don't want to make this the narrative, but I feel like it's harder to be a woman and doing it. Cause it's like all of these, I don't want to make this a narrative, but I'll make this my entire uh, line of questioning and my entire brand. And, and I'll just talk about peeing myself cause I have babies. So make sure to know I'm a woman, make sure to think of me as woman um, that, ha that pees myself at your conference. But then <laughs> I don't know. I'll let her talk. I'll let her answer this. Like, this is, I don't want to make this the narrative, but here's the narrative that I've come up with. Things that I'm supposed to, you should be home with your woman and doing it. Cause it's like this back, there's narrative, actual fact, Yeah. but there's so much shit. And I, I don't want to make this the narrative, but I feel like it's harder to be a woman and doing it. Cause it's like all of these things that I'm supposed to, you should be home with your kids. You yeah. should be yeah. all the, all the, all the beliefs of other people. As long as we allow, and it still happens, happens much rarely now at 60, I wish I could say it was true at 40. It wasn't. So I'm telling you this, this truthfully, I don't want to shoot you straight. Um, now at this stage, it's a different game because mm. there's such an accumulated impact in people and knowing who the hell I am. Yeah. But at 39 or 40 years old, you know, I'd question it. I'd feel bad about it. I, you know, trying to please everybody and all that shit. And I was a pleaser. That's why yeah. I was in a relationship where I was really unhappy. I stayed in a relationship that was totally wrong for me. Because I was such a pleaser. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want to make her unhappy. And it was right. like, I was making, you know, I was so happy in my work and with my kids that it didn't matter I wasn't happy here. Right. But when I turned 40, is when I finally said, no, enough of this. I don't want to live another decade this way. Yeah. And that was the beginning of saying, no, no, I'm not going to live for what other people think or feel. It doesn't mean I don't care, but it, I'm just not going to let that be the priority. And rarely in my life has that shown up. There's for moments it's shown up since that time. But before that's there. So you're actually on the cusp of freedom. You're on the cusp of a point where your brain will say, no fucking more. Yeah. Right? I'm not going to fucking let these people, people do this. And then they'll see the moments, but it won't be the dominant force in your life. Right. And so pick your direction and go and refine it. And I think you're going to, you're going to surprise yourself. Yeah. You're going <laughs> to, I promise you, we'll bump into each other at some point in the next 24, 36 months. And you're going to tell me how great you've broken through and driven areas. Not phony, not fake. Yeah. Just like, why are these challenges, problems? And we got this conversation, but. You know what? I really figured this out. I figured that out. I feel like a different woman. I feel like a, it, it sounds so corny, but it's nice to have mentors that are older, but it's really hard to find mentors that are going through what you're going through. Even for me as a man, it was so, yeah. so hard. But if you can find a few people that lived 18 or 20 years more than you and not five or three, yeah, there's a different perspective. So I had a gentleman in my life, Peter Guber, who's 
18 years my senior. Okay, he's talking on and on and on. I want to get back to what she said. Um, <laughs> you know, and I hate to bring it up again, but the Skinny Confidential podcast where she she talks about, you know, getting canceled a little bit. She doesn't go into full, full details like I would like. But she makes it seem in that podcast that, you know, oh, everyone was hating on me and I was just trying to help women and like, how dare everyone get mad that I made a mistake and I've learned from my mistakes and blah, blah, blah. And this whole thing about, you know, women wanting to mom shame me. Okay, I've already said that. But she also, within the same podcast, says, all I want to do, all I care about in my life is coming home and being a mama and cooking dinner for my kids. So is it really other people projecting that onto you? Or is it you yourself, at least now, in this new modern rage day, that wants to be this mom that is, you know, super mom, and she wants to stay home and do the podcast from home now. She no longer wants to be boss babe. She wants to be at-home mom. So is that not your own beliefs? So why are you saying, like, women don't want me to do this? Women don't want me to work? It's like, yeah, Dave's, you know, mom or whatever had, like, problems with you working. I think that's messed up. You should do whatever you want all, at all times you know, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, it's kind of my philosophy. But like, she makes it seem like all these women project their feelings on me. But then she's also saying my own feelings are exactly what they're saying. So what's, the, you know, like, all she says now is like, I want to be home with my kids. That's all I care about. I want to be home with my kids. Then do that. But don't say other women are making you do that. Because then I'm confused. It's like, what's the like, what do you actually want? I don't think she knows. <sighs> I digress. Okay, back. And by the time, I didn't really get to know him until I was 40. But as I did, I remember in the beginning, he would tell me, this is what you're going to probably go through at this stage. And I remember in the beginning, I loved him, respect him. And I thought, well, everybody goes through different things. There's certain things everybody goes through. <laughs> but by going through to them, you get to the other side. And what's on the other side is you owning yourself. Yeah. And you own yourself to a great extent. But I promise you, in three or four or five years, let's say, you know, by the time you're 42, three, four, something of that nature, you are going to be a different person. You're the same soul. But your fucking ownership and what can move you and whether or not your ex can affect, none of that shit's going to affect you anymore. And your kids, you're going to stay, they're gonna, thing, things aren't, aren't ideal, but you're going to see the, the trajectory of who they're becoming and you won't be so hard on yourself. Yeah. That's all coming quicker than you know. And you don't have to even do anything, it'll happen because you're on a trajectory of growth. Yeah. Right? It'll, it'll show up. God will guide you. All right. <laughs> Let's fucking go. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> That was a, I, not to nitpick this, but isn't that a weird way to stand up? I don't, we have to say her, see her cursing again, which I think is funny. Let's fucking go. Let's go. They stand up at the same time and like, don't look at each other though. Weird. <laughs> oh boy. What a world. What, a, what an experience we've shared together we've shared in this moment in time. So what do you think? I think part two was better than part one. Part one was like a nauseating, uh, just blah, 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 medical facts from Tony Robbins himself. Um, and I was not, uh, I was not intrigued by that. I, I didn't care. The second part, I didn't really care about, oops, 90% of what he was saying. Um, but then I, I liked that ending, not liked, like, oh, I was impressed by it. I just liked it because it revealed some of her thought process. But don't you agree? Am I insane? Like, I don't think so, that, that she will say, oh, I see a Camellia's uh, comment that, yeah, she, I don't think she wants to be home. I agree. I don't think she wants to be home either, but she makes it seem like, oh, that's what I, I think that's what she thinks she should say, maybe. I don't know. Um, while we're here, uh, maybe I'll do a little preview. You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. This is uh, someone Rachel recommends highly and says uh, she's, it's helped her get through lots of things. Um, there's a whole section of different ailments, physical ailments, and like what's caused it and how to fix it, right? And by how to fix it is like you repeating this mantra to yourself. So I just wanted to uh, <laughs> pick a couple funny ones. Uh, let's go to... Anus. <laughs> okay, ready? All right, so here's the anus section. Uh, not the whole page, but there's like at least five different things. Um, so just as a preview. Okay, so if you have uh, 
itching in your anus. Um, according to Louise Hay, it means you have guilt over your past <laughs> and remorse. Um, to get rid of this uh, itching in your anus, uh, you have to say to yourself, I lovingly forgive myself. I am free. So don't scratch your booty. Just say, I lovingly forgive myself. I am free. Uh, what else? Anyone have any requests for uh, <laughs> illnesses and, and issues um, that you want to see what you could fix? Sweating. That's a good one. I just saw sweating. Okay. This will help Tony Robbins. Let's help Tony Robbins. He needs our help. What if this is like, I invited him on our show. I'm like, okay, here, I'm going to solve your issues. Swelling. Oh God, there's, there's a one, there's one for unaliving yourself. There's a way that you can stop it. Great. Uh, sweat, there's no sweating. Dang it. Ah, Amelia Bolsas. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's see. Where did you come through? Oh no. Oh no. Oh wait. Oh, goodbye. Wait, is that you? I don't know. It said that you're saying goodbye. So goodbye. Thanks for being here. Uh, I guess, I guess you're oh, epilepsy. Okay. That's a good one. I did see that one, I believe. And this is just for funsies. This is not the full review, obviously. I just have it here and I thought this was like the most interesting part. Okay, epilepsy. <clears throat> so in reality, the person that you know that has epilepsy uh, has a sense of persecution, a rejection of life, a feeling of great struggle and self-violence. Okay, I don't know how that makes sense, but all right. Uh, and you should tell the person to say, I choose to see life as eternal and joyous. I am eternal and joyous and at peace. There you go. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Itchy skin. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, how about you want to do like a serious one? Get really upset? Okay, there's a separate category for buttocks unrelated to anus. A whole separate category. If you have some sort of issues uh, with your buttocks, it apparently represents power. Loose buttocks. <laughs> if you have a loose butt, I don't know if that means, like it's different than your anus. It's not a loose anus, it's loose buttocks. Loss of power. I use my power wisely. I am strong, I am safe, all is well. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Let's see. Oh, uh, cellulite. If you want to get rid of your cellulite, here's the trick. Cellulite is stored anger and self-punishment. Okay. Uh, you have to say to yourself, I forgive others. I forgive myself. I am free. Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll do one more. Halitosis. I see halitosis. Let's see if that one's on there. Sounds like one. There's even one for death. It's like, okay, I think I, uh, it's too late if I'm already dead to read this <laughs> analogy to myself. Halitosis. Halitosis. Okay. Wait, there is one. Okay, it's your lucky day. <clears throat> Rotten attitude, vile gossip, and foul thinking. She must have known someone with halitosis and thought they were a bad person. Uh, to, to get rid of that, you have to say, I speak with gentleness and love. I exhale only the good. So throw away that bottle of Listerine and start repeating the mantra today. Uh, come back in five weeks and let me know how it goes. Um, all right. Final, final things. Uh, in the description of this video, there is a link to to sadness. Uh, merch, which if you didn't know, is still available online and I will show you right now what it looks like. Bam. Choose sadness shirts, choose sadness mugs, stickers, other shirts, other mugs, bags, masks. We are very pro mask on this channel. Unlike Tony Robbins, I don't think he'll be wearing a mask anytime soon based on the, the, uh, <laughs> 
based on the uh, comments he made <laughs> via that podcast. Uh, still there, still available. And uh, once you, if you already have merch, please text me, or not text me, uh, please DM me a picture on Instagram. I will not be giving out my phone number on this channel or ever. Uh, and I will reshare it. I think I want to collect them all and we can put them in like a little intro or something because I want to have a commercial type thing that I'm going to play because I can play videos on this channel. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but I can. So if you're interested, the link is in the bio or in the bio. God, we're in Instagram. The link is in the description below. And uh, I would love to share your photos if you've already received something and let me know what you think if you like it. And then I'm thinking 15,000, which, you know, is a while away to be fair. But we have lots of ideas for uh, different merch things. So the next, the next launch, the next merch launch will be something, some sort of uh, inside insiders thing to something on the channel. We have uh, an onion blooming, a vacuum blooming out of an onion uh, in relation to Dave Hollis's new symbol or whatever he does. Uh, free, free, free Jack and Jeff and Ford, really all the, but I wouldn't leave the kids out. I'm not gonna use the kids' names because that's, that's crossing the line. But Jack and Jeff, a dog and the videographer are f fair game, <laughs> I think. Because we're, we're, we're just wanting their release. We just want them to be free and have fun and be able to do whatever they want to do, as opposed to listening to Rachel Hollis talk about the thong song. <sighs> Anyways, thank you guys for being here. And uh, I don't know if Camelia is still here, but we will be going live on Thursday. If you like live streams and you like us, uh, we will be live on Cringe Fluencers channel. I will show you that in just a quick second as my computer loads. Okay, and make sure to stall <laughs> efficiently. Don't let the viewers know that you are not in the place yet. Okay, here we go. Cringe fluencers. Uh, this is where we talk about all different types of people on the internet who are cringe, not just Rachel Hollis. That's this channel. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you for being here. Like I said, tomorrow I will release the uh, Rachel Hollis uh, podcast, Skinny Confidential. I have a lot to say on that. I just thought it'd be uh, important to do it correctly so I don't just go off the cuff, I think it's important to make a big point about it to make it be actually what I have to say. All right, toodles, rock on, choose sadness, welcome to the sob gang. I don't love you, but that's okay because we're friends on the internet, not in real life. And it's important to find real love with your family members and people in your real life, not parasocial relationships. So on that note, don't love you, but I hope you're doing great and have a great day and come back tomorrow. Okay, bye.